Hey, it's me, MLB. Here is the completed book of Why You, Why Me, Back Ago X Female Listener. Enjoy. You sat up with a jolt, your eyes scanning the room around you. Oh, not this again. You groaned internally and rubbed your eyes. You were, you were in a strange yet familiar room. Strange because it wasn't your room, but familiar because this had happened once before. Last week, you had magically started swapping bodies with a boy named Bakugo Katsuki. He had a ripped body and was damn good looking, but had a bit of a temper from what it sounded like the way people acted around you. Fortunately, the first time that you swapped bodies was on a weekend, so you had the whole day to rummage through the things in his room to find out as much as you could about him. This time was the weekend as well, and you thanked your lucky stars that it wasn't on a weekday. You knew he went to UA High School, and he had a quirk, which was cool. You didn't have one. His quirk was explosion, and he could de detonate blasts from his hands. You tried it out in his room and left a hole in the wall. Whoops, sorry Bakugo. He had a good dress sense and liked to watch movies. His mum seemed nice enough, and his dad was a sweetheart. They were really worried about you when you came downstairs in the morning and greeted them politely. His mum got suspicious right away and claimed that it was someone else in his body, which it definitely was, but you couldn't tell her that. That night, you and he magically swapped back again, and you woke up in your own room. Much to your delight, it was a relief. You skipped happily down the stairs and looked into the lounge room. Your two sisters and grandma were there. Hi guys, you greeted them chirpily. They turned to look at you and froze. Are you okay today, Yin? Your youngest sister, Mika, asked. Yeah, why? You asked in confusion. Because yesterday I asked how you were and you swore at me, she said, pouting. You gasped. You never swore. Oh, Bakugo must have sworn at them. Oh, I'm, I'm really sorry, Mika. I was just having a bad day, you replied sheepishly. Period. Your other sister, Zura, asked. Uh, yeah, you replied, not really knowing what other excuse to use. Your grandmother eyed you suspiciously, but didn't say anything. So you excused yourself and went to the kitchen. Your mum and dad were there having breakfast. Morning, mum. Morning, dad, you said with a bright smile. Do you want extra spicy noodles again this morning? Your mum asked you, a hint of confusion in her voice. But I don't like hot... You were about to say that you didn't like spicy things, but you stopped yourself. Oh, must have been Bakugo's preference. Oh, uh, no thanks, mum. I'll have my usual breakfast today. You smiled sweetly again. Okay, she said, watching you suspiciously. You sat down and ate breakfast, then prepared for school, wondering what to do about the swapping bodies thing. How many times was it going to happen? That night, you and Bakugo swapped again, and you awoke to his alarm in his room. It was a Tuesday morning. Oh, crap, school. You pulled yourself out of bed and turned his alarm off. Glancing over into the mirror, you checked out his body. Damn, this boy is cut, you thought, running your hands all over his chiseled abs. You looked at the face in the mirror and peered into the brilliant red eyes that stared back at you. What a face. You walked down the hall to the shower and paused. Oh no, I have to take a shower. I have to take his clothes off. You panicked a bit and then closed your eyes, removed the clothes and then hopped into the shower. The hot water felt great on your back and you tilted your head back and ran your fingers through the thick ash blonde hair. You peeked out of one eye and grabbed for the soap, lathering yourself up and avoiding any embarrassing areas as much as possible. You managed to have a decent shower, then came to the drying part. All was going well until it came to Bakugo's nether regions. You froze, eyes still shut. How the hell do I dry this without touching it? You paused, then bunched the towel up thickly in your hand and slapped it over his crotch, patting ferociously. There we go, that ought to do it, you thought triumphantly, wrapping the towel around your waist and opening your eyes. First shower ever complete. You grinned and flung the door open. His mum was standing right there and you screamed, a very high-pitched scream. She fell apart laughing. Katsuki, you scream like a girl, she cackled. That's because I am one, you thought. Sorry, you replied hurriedly and slipped past her. Sorry, she yelled in awe and surprise after you as you waddled off down the hall. Who are you? What the hell is wrong with this Bakugo guy? Why doesn't he have any manners, you thought. You shook your head and got dressed with your eyes shut again. You threw the down, down the breakfast quickly and raced out the door, grabbing his phone out and punching in the directions to UA. You found it easily enough and walked through the gates. A happy, good-looking, muscular redhead came up to you and said good morning. You replied in your usual happy way and he looked confused. You didn't call me shitty hair, he said, almost sounding hurt. 
Oh, sorry, shitty hair? You replied happily, and he nearly passed out. Sorry, he wheezed. You looked at him, confused. What the heck was wrong with these people? Kaminari! The redhead yelled. Come here, bro. Say hi to Bakugo. I'd rather not, the boy called Kaminari said, sauntering over. You looked him over. He was cute. He had yellow hair with a black lightning bolt through the fringe and a very friendly looking face. Sup, dude? He said casually. Hey! You replied, replied brightly, your face lighting up like a Christmas tree. Kaminari froze and burst out laughing. What the hell? He gasped. Bakugo, your face! What's wrong with my face? You asked, touching your cheeks. Bro, you actually look happy. You just smiled. You didn't have that permanent scowl on your face. Are you okay? The redhead asked. A scowl? You questioned. Like this? You scrunched your brows up and gritted your teeth. Yeah, that one. That's your usual look, the redhead said, laughing again. This feels so uncomfortable. What is wrong with this Bakugo guy? Why is he so angry at the world, you thought. You kept the scowl on your face and walked into the classroom. Everyone went about their business and ignored you. You looked around and wondered which seat was yours. Ah, oh, crap, I don't know where I usually sit. You sauntered over to an unoccupied desk and sat down. A very curvaceous girl with long black hair pulled into a ponytail approached you and placed a hand on your desk. What's the big idea, Bakugo? She asked. Why are you in my seat? Oh, you scowled. Sorry, I'll move. You got up and removed yourself from her seat and walked away. She gaped at you, very confused. Kaminari and the redhead were watching from the door. Kaminari was doubled over with laughter and the redhead was wiping tears of laughter from his eyes. You stormed over to them. Hey, you shot angrily. I'm doing my best, okay? Ah, uh, that's closer to the real you, Kaminari quipped, regaining his composure. Do you know where you sit? The redhead asked. No, you replied shortly, face still scowling. You sit over there. He gestured to a chair by the window. Okay, thanks. You scowled again and marched to your seat. What's happened to him, Kiri? Kaminari asked the red-headed guy. No idea, but this is hilarious, he said, chuckling again. A green-haired boy approached the desk in front of you and eyed you nervously as he sat down. M -m Morning, Kachan, he stammered. Um, hi, you said, rubbing your brows. They were getting sore from scowling so much. The green-haired guy just looked at you curiously, his eyes studying your face. You froze and watched him as he studied you. Y you okay? He asked, a little more confidently this time. Not really, but I'll be okay. I just have to get through this day and everything will go back to normal. As you spoke, you forgot to maintain the scowl and the boy's eyes widened. He looked to his left and made eye contact with Kaminari and Karishma, who were still keeping an eye on the very uncharacteristic and comical new Bakugo. He looked back at you and you smiled nervously. He nearly died. He quickly excused himself and ran over to the two guys who were in another fit of giggles by now. The green-haired boy asked a lot of questions at whisper level to them and an animated conversation ensued. You couldn't hear what was being said but just sighed heavily. Uh, well, looks like I've already failed at living someone else's life and uh, it's not even halfway through the first day. You looked down at your desk and rested your chin in your hand. This is so frustrating. Classes were hard. You had no idea what was going on but you did your best to keep up. The lunch bell rang and you made a beeline for the door. Unfortunately, Kaminari beat you to it and blocked your way out. Hey, hey, hold up there, buddy, he said with a smirk. What do you want, you growled, brows furrowed menacingly. You just wanted to get away for a bit to collect yourself. Yeah, it was pretty close, actually, said making comment about your words and facial expression. Please leave me alone, you said, allowing an exasperated expression to take over your face. I'm not feeling right and I just need space. You're damn right you're not feeling right, Karishima said with a chuckle. What's happened to you? You look from one guy to the other. They obviously know me really well. I should probably tell them what's going on. Maybe they can help me, you thought. Okay, follow me, you said, starting off down the hallway. Hey, well, wait a minute. Do you even know where you're going? Kaminari chuckled, running in front of you. Here, I'll lead. The three of you headed outside and around to the back of the building. Okay, so what's up with you? Kaminari asked. You sighed and flapped your arms in effeminate distress. Guys, you whined. I don't know what's going on, but I keep getting stuck in this body and I hate him. He sounds like a terrible person. I don't know what to do, you wailed. Kirishima was trying desperately to hold his laughter in and Kaminari was shocked. You looked at them and sighed. Sorry, should I have told you in a gentler way? No, no, this is fine, Kirishima said with a chuckle. I don't get it though, what's going on? 
You explained how you were actually Yin, a female, in Bakugo's body, and how you two appeared to be swapping bodies every so often, the most recent swap leaving a day between the gaps so that you could get your bearings again. You were pretty sure that Bakugo was in your body the same day that you were in his, and you lamented on what he could be doing to your reputation at that very moment. You sighed. Hey, look, it's okay, we'll keep this secret, all right? Kemenari said, being more serious. We like this strangely nice Bakugo, but we understand that we can't let this get out of hand. You smiled at him, and he placed a hand on your shoulder. You're really sweet, Kemenari, he said softly, smiling at him. Thank you so much. You can kiss me if you want, he replied cheekily. Bro, what? Kirishima yelped. What, dude? I just want to see what Bakugo's lips feel like against mine. You blushed. Dude, that's so messed up, Kirishima said again, horrified. Kaminari burst out laughing. I'm joking, dude, I'm joking. He turned and winked at you. But, you know, I'm always here for you, babe. Kami! Kirishima yelled again. The two of you are so weird, but nice. And Kirishima, you're pretty hot too, he said, shooting Kirishima a cocky side glance. The poor redhead went tomato red and backed away. D -d Don't say that with his face, he stammered. Kaminari burst out laughing again. Oh, this is going to be so much fun. Okay, but seriously, you're going to have to help me with people's names and lockers and quirks stuff and all of that, you said, interrupting Kaminari's comedy session. No problem at all, dude. I got you covered, he said with a smile. The person you'll have to know the most about is your childhood friend, Midoriya Izuku. Which one's he? you asked. Green, curly-haired guy, Kaminari replied, making a curly-haired gesture with his hands. But it's okay. You're super rude and mean to him, so you don't need to say much. What? Why am I mean to him? You asked, shocked. Well, it's because you, Bakugo, thought he didn't have a quirk and then all of a sudden he did and it feels like he's been lied to, but that's only the half of it, Kaminari said, waving his hand dismissively. Don't think too much about it. Uh, okay, you said, tilting your head curiously. All you really need to know is that he calls you Kachan and you call him shitty nerd and constantly say you'll beat the life out of him if he gets in your way, he added. Kurishima nodded in agreement. Man, what kind of asshole is Bakugo, you said with a disgusted look on your face. Does he have nasty names for everyone? Uh, pretty much, said Kurishima. I'm shitty hair, for example. And I'm dunce face, Kaminari said proudly. You snorted. And yet you still hang out with this guy? You asked, perplexed. Well, yeah, Kurishima said. Bakugo may be an asshole, but he's smart, courageous, and a ball of natural talent. He's amazing and super manly, he gushed proudly. Gotta agree. Kaminari said. He's not that bad when you figure him out. You snorted with amusement and shook your head. Okay, then I'll take your word for it. Oh, one last thing. If you don't know someone's name, just call them an extra, Kaminari said, turning to head back inside. Your face fell. You kidding me, right? After all you just said, he really is just a nasty person. Karishima laughed. It'll take you a while to get used to him, but just do your best and scowl a lot. Use swear words like an adjective and don't be nice to people. Always look like you're on the verge of a rampage. You cross your arms across your chest. What the hell do you mean you swear words like an adjective, you extra? Close, Kaminari said. He shitty hair, remember? But still, that wasn't bad. You smiled brightly. Nope, you lost it, Kaminari said again, falling apart laughing. That afternoon, you found your way back to Bakugo's home and went to his room, flopping down on his bed. What a day, you thought before falling into a deep sleep. When you woke the next morning, you were back in your own bed, in your own house. You jumped up happily and raced downstairs. You got that same stare from the family that you had the last time that you and Bakugo had swapped bodies, but you just apologised and made an excuse before heading off to school. You got there and greeted your friends as usual. They gave you an odd look. You okay today? Your friend Akira asked. Yeah, why? You asked reluctantly. You really didn't want to know what kind of hell Bakugo had caused in your life yesterday. You're just really angry, she said, a little traumatised. I'm so sorry, okay, he said, giving her a hug. It's okay, she said, smiling at you. I'm just glad you're alright today. As you were sitting in class, you flicked your notebook open to write something down and you saw a note scribbled at the bottom of the page. Who the hell are you? It read. You stared at it. Did I write this? Who wrote this? You asked Akira at lunch if she'd written it, and she said she hadn't. Oh, it could have been Bakugo, you thought, as you stared at it again in the afternoon class. You picked up your pen and wrote underneath it, I'm Yin Lin, who are you? 
That night, you went to sleep, praying that you would wake up in your own body again. But unfortunately, that wasn't the case. You woke up to that strangely familiar room that was starting to become more familiar every time it happened. You completed your morning routine and headed for school and made it to your seat in class before either Karishima or Kaminari arrived and waited. Soon after you sat down, they entered, staring at you as they walked in. What the heck are you looking at? You scowled, watching them with as much hatred as you could muster. I think it's him again, dude, Kaminari whispered to Karishima. Nah, I'm sure it's her, Karishima whispered back. Oi, back you go. What's my name? Kaminari asked, leaning down on your desk. That's easy, dunce face. Your name's Kaminari, you replied with smugness, lacing every inch of your words. Yeah, but what's my first name? He sneered. Oh, crap, he never told me what his first name was, you thought. Your first name doesn't matter, you extra, you sniggered. Oh, you're good, he said, winking at you. Yeah, it's her, Kiri, he said over his shoulder to Karishima. Told you, he said proudly. Your face fell. How did you know? You look too relaxed in your seat, Karishima said, gesturing to your casual posture. But your speech was spot on. You beamed. Kaminari collapsed, laughing. I'm never going to be able to get over smiling back ago, he laughed. So, Kiri, how am I supposed to sit, you asked, looking past the still laughing blonde to Karishima. Just look constipated, but like you need to spread out as much as possible, he said with a shrug. How, how on earth am I supposed to do that? You asked incredulously. Heck, Kaminari corrected. How the heck am I supposed to do that? Oh, sorry, thanks, he said, smiling at him again. He lost it. God, Kaminari, seriously, pull yourself together, man, you said, watching him fall to the ground in a fit of giggles. That night, you opened up notes in Bakugo's phone and told him about the things that happened that day. You wrote down a small reminder on his wrist in pen for him to check the note section of his phone the next day. Then you fell asleep. The next day, you were back in your body again. Bakugo had nearly gotten you expelled, which was wonderful, not, and he had left you a charming reply under your message back to him in your notebook. He had asked, who the hell are you? You had replied with, I'm Yin Lin, who are you? And he had responded with, I'm Bakugo Katsuki, why have I ended up in a useless, quirkless extra's body? Such an endearing response. You rolled your eyes. This idiot needs to be taken down a peg or two, you thought. You wondered if he'd gotten your note that you'd left him in his phone. You didn't have to wonder too long because the very next day you were back in his body again. You checked notes in his phone first thing in the morning and there was his reply. What the hell are you doing telling shitty hair and dunce face about us swapping? It's embarrassing, okay? Don't you dare make friends with anyone in my body. Don't even smile with my face. Understand, you useless girl. I'll blow your face off otherwise. And don't you dare look down my pants. You'd been reading his reply angrily, but cracked a smile at the last line. <laughs> what an idiot. That day at school, you noticed one of the girls in the class, Eurarika, had bought a new lip gloss. Forgetting who you were momentarily, you approached her. Oh my god, is that the new MAC lip gloss? Her jaw dropped. You froze. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, ugly ass lip gloss you got there, you growled. She narrowed her eyes at you and stared you down. You returned her stare and stood motionless. Karishima saw what happened and slid in to pull you away quickly, making a hurried apology slash excuse to Eurarika about you being unwell and dragged you off down the hall. She was quite rightly confused and suspicious and kept an eye on you all afternoon. You had to keep to standard and pay extra close attention to your words and actions that day. The body swapping every second day went on for close to nine months and your routines got smoother and smoother. It was just like living a double life, except you had to play the part of someone else in the second life and their mannerisms had already been established. You were doing a mighty fine job by now on your Bakugo days and your control of his quirk was getting better and better. A lot of his quirk control was inbuilt, hardwired. Sometimes you felt his body move on its own, which was bizarre and cool at the same time. He hated your life. He told you often in your messages to each other in the notes section of his phone. He hated being quirkless and useless, inverted commas. He hated how flat-chested, inverted commas, you were. And so you retaliated by saying he had a small penis, which he definitely didn't. You'd already seen it a few times, by accident. Oh, okay, maybe not by accident. He had threatened the life of your sisters and had terrorised your family. But weirdly enough, you were growing to like this explosive disgrace of a human. 
Karishima and Kaminari were a big help to you, and you always mentioned them in your notes to Bakugo, telling him to treat them nicer because they deserved it. He said that he didn't. You weren't surprised. One afternoon, you were with your family at the park having a picnic. It was a lovely sunny afternoon, and you were back in your own body, which was always great. Your younger sister, Mika, had bought a frisbee to play with, and you and her were tossing it back and forth. She threw it hard and it flew towards the road, so you ran after it as fast as you could and jumped up to grab it, not realising how far you had jumped into the line of the oncoming traffic. A truck collected you as it came down the road and knocked you flying. When you finally came to a stop, you didn't move. The terrified screams of your family members filled the air and an ambulance was called to take you to hospital. You died three times on your way there, but they managed to revive you each time and kept you alive. The next three months were hell for you, as you underwent test after test. You were placed in medical comas every so often so that they could watch your brain activity and you'd wake up with a significant amount of amnesia. The body swaps stopped happening. When you were finally discharged from the hospital, you tried to resume a normal life, but something just felt wrong. Something was missing, but you couldn't put your finger on it. Your grandma noticed you going deep into thought every now and again and kept an eye on you. She knew something was off and she thought she knew how to fix it, but now wasn't the right time, so she waited patiently. You started developing seizures and your concerned parents took you to a doctor who referred you to a specialist in the city. Your whole family had to move for your sake, which they did happily. The specialist ran some tests on you and he seemed surprised by the results that came back. Yin, I'm going to ask you a very strange question and I want you to answer me truthfully, the kindly specialist said, leaning against the desk in his white lab coat. Have you ever had anything like an out-of-body experience or that you felt like you were someone else? You frowned in thought and pondered a bit before replying. No, sir, I don't think I have. He looked at you curiously. Okay, I'm only asking because there are parts of someone else's DNA mixed in with yours. You looked at him in surprise. What? I know it sounds crazy, but this phenomenon, albeit strange, wasn't exactly uncommon and used to happen frequently around 80 years ago. It was thought that this was some kind of genetic mutation that would bring soulmates together, and in most cases it did. He smiled. This still happens these days too, but it's a little more rare. You looked at him again curiously. No, sir, I'm sorry. I can't say that I have ever remember having anything like that. Well, he said with a sigh, these seizures apparently appear to be happening because the DNA of the other person in your system is trying to merge with you, or in other words, contact you. You looked at him baffled. My soulmate's looking for me? Yes, basically, he replied simply. I can only assume that you and this person were connected either by mind or body for a while and when you had your accident the connection stopped and now they want to know why. You smiled nervously. Um, but what if I don't like them back? Well, that's a problem for you and not me, he said with a chuckle. I'm a medical practitioner, not a matchmaker. You giggled slightly in response and thanked him for his time, then walked out to meet your mother, who had been waiting in the room with your grandma. What did he say? Your mum asked. Weird stuff, mum. Really weird stuff. Like what? She asked with a small chuckle. I'll explain in the car, you replied. You're not going to believe it. No, Yin, I don't think that's crazy at all, your mum said after you told her about what the specialist had said to you. You actually did go through a period where you acted really, really out of character every second day. It was so strange, but you never explained yourself, so we just grew to accept it. Strange as in how, you asked, and, and why don't I remember any of this? You probably don't remember because of your accident. You did get pretty bad amnesia at one point, darling. It could have erased your memory, your mum said. Back to the strange things, she started, wanting to clarify your other question. You would swear like a sailor, you called your sisters extras and you loved spicy food. Your jaw dropped open. You can't be serious, you said, deadpanning. Your grandma, who had stayed quiet this whole time, finally spoke. Yes, dear. We were all there when it happened. But I don't even like spicy food, you said. Maybe I have some kind of schizophrenia? Your grandma chuckled. No, sweetheart, I don't think so. She looked at you with a little sparkle in her eye that you couldn't help but take notice of. When you got home, you went to your room to ponder these things. You were lying on your bed deep in thought when a soft knock drew your attention to the door. You got up and opened it. It was your grandma. Can I come in for a minute? There's something I want to tell you, she said with an excited little smile. 
You loved how your grandma always seemed to have this little hint of sparkle in her. A cheeky side that always bubbled to the surface at the most random of times. Sure, grandma, he said with a big grin. She waddled in and sat down on your bed, patting the spot beside her, indicating for you to join her. You did, plopping yourself down and crossing your legs in front of you. Yin, dear, I have a secret that I've kept for many years, but I feel it's right to tell you now. What is it, grandma? You asked expectantly. Your grandma had lived a full life. She was well into her 80s now, and you always loved the little life lessons that she brought to you. When I was younger, younger than you, probably around the age of nine, I had the same experiences that you had, she said proudly. You didn't really know what she was talking about and furrowed your brows. The seizures? you asked, cocking your head to the side. No, no, she chuckled. Out of body experiences. But I don't remember the out of body experiences, he replied, confused. Yes, but just because you don't remember them doesn't mean they didn't happen, she chided, one knobby crooked finger raised in warning. I had the experiences of swapping bodies with a boy about the same age as me for close to a year. You what? you asked incredulously. This was all so surreal sounding. So what happened? you asked, curious to hear the end of the tale. Well, we were very young and this kind of thing was common at that time. I just enjoyed the experiences and when the swapping stopped happening, I moved on, she said, ending the story much too abruptly for your liking. Wait, wait, you said, shaking your head. You're telling me that you had a soulmate that you were swapping bodies with and you didn't end up with them? Yes, she said, grinning at you. I don't understand the moral of this story, you said. Is she telling me it's okay that I don't have a soulmate anymore? You asked yourself. Well, I will be honest with you, Yin, dear. I regret not seeking out my soulmate. We were very young and didn't see the importance of it, so I let it slide, she said, sighed heavily. I did love your grandfather dearly, but I always wondered what my life would have been had I pursued my soulmate. Do you remember the soulmate's name? You asked. Oh, of course I do. I remember a lot of things about him, she said, smiling gently at you. Then we'll go and find him for you, Grandma, he said excitedly. She chuckled softly. That's very sweet of you, my darling, but my time is done. My years are coming to an end and my decisions in life have been final. She reached over and took your hand. Don't let this go without at least trying to find the person that you were connected with. Don't live with regrets. She got up, patted your head with her other hand before turning and walking to your door. She opened it and walked out, closing it softly behind her. You watched her go, thinking about everything that she had said and the things that have happened that day. Where do I even start though? I don't even remember anything, you thought. Kurishima and Kaminari watched Bakugo intently. He was on a rampage about Midoriya again and was muttering angrily under his breath. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's the real him, Karishma whispered from the side of his mouth to Kaminari, not taking his eyes off Bakugo. Yeah, I'm with you, but if it's her, then she's doing a pretty damn good job today, Kaminari replied, whispering from the side of his mouth back to Karishma. Bakugo stopped what he was doing and turned to face the blonde and the redhead, who were watching intently from the sidelines. You too, he growled, narrowing his eyes as he turned and stormed over to them. What the hell are you looking at? He got right up in their faces, staring at them threateningly. How are you today, Yin? Kaminari asked with a smirk. It was a very bold move. You're wrong this time, dunce face. It's me, King Explosion Murder, and I'm about to do the explosion murder part on your face. He grabbed Kaminari by the collar and yanked him closer. Whoa, whoa, bro. What's wrong with you today? You're extra annoyed, Kirishima commented, placing his hand on Bakugo's arm to stop him from blasting poor Kaminari. No reason, Bakugo spat, throwing Kaminari to the ground before storming off. Something's definitely wrong, Karishima said to a relieved Kaminari, helping him to his feet. Something's eating away at him, I can tell. Yeah, his lack of manners is slowly killing him, Kaminari commented, brushing his uniform down. Bakugo was indeed out of sorts. It had been a week of no body swapping for him, and at first he was overjoyed. Finally, I get to stay in my own perfect, extraordinary body with no useless, quirkless girl interfering, he had thought. But the longer he stayed in his body, the more he felt empty. He didn't understand the feeling and would fly off the handle to compensate for these strange emotions. Where did she go? 
did she find someone better to swap with? I'm the best. She should only be swapping with me. He thought all these thoughts and it just made him more irate. He found himself gravitating towards the quirk registry, walking past the doors of the building. He wanted to go in and look up your name, try and find out where you went, but his pride never allowed him to push the doors open. Even the mention of your name would send him over the edge. Karishima and Kaminari would ask how you were doing and if he knew any more about you or why you two had stopped swapping bodies. Their questions only made him angrier because he didn't know the answer and he didn't like that he didn't know the answer. It was frustrating him. Did you know why it had stopped happening? And were you sitting back somewhere laughing at him, looking down at him? It made his blood boil. Months went by and slowly the burning desire to know the answer just resided as a dull ache in the back of his mind and he moved on with his life. He still kept the notes that you two had written to each other in his phone and would read them over when he was alone in his room. Are you sure you want to get a new job? Your mum asked, cocking an eyebrow at you. You had just told her that you wanted to get out and experience life a little more. Since your move to the city, you had wanted to try and make the most of your new life. Yes, I'm sure, you responded confidently. I've already applied at a few places. You raised your fingers to list them off. Cafe down the road, corner store and a music record place in the next block, you grinned brightly. Okay, sweetheart, if you're sure, she said with a little hesitation. Positive, you said with a firm nod of your head. Two weeks went by and you finally got a call back. The corner store accepted your application. You were to start next week. You were overjoyed, the understatement of the year, and couldn't wait to show how grown up you were. Your first day on the job went, okay, only a few customers and they all grabbed a few items each, nothing too strenuous. You busied yourself stacking the shells in between the smattering of customers and hummed happily as you went about your day. The next day went smoothly as well and you were quite enjoying your time on this job, your first job ever. On the third day, a boy about your age came in. He had yellow hair with a black lightning strike through the fringe and you were struck by how familiar he looked. You watched him curiously as he walked around the shop looking for something. Can I help you? He called out in a friendly voice from behind the counter. He looked over at you, noticing you for the first time and smiled. Hey, you knew? He asked, strolling over. Yeah, third day on, you replied proudly. Are you from around here? Yeah, I go to the school just around the corner, he replied, leaning on the counter and giving you a sly smirk. Looks like I'll be coming here a little more often though, he said with a wink. You blushed slightly at his gently flirtatious comment and giggled out nervously. Oh, uh, um, you look familiar. Have we met before? You asked after regaining your composure. Do I look like a new boyfriend or something? He asked cheekily. Are you always like this? You chuckled, not believing that this guy was cracking onto you so hard after only having met you two minutes ago. I'm serious though, I feel like I know you from somewhere. He thought a moment then smiled. Oh, probably TV. I was on the sports festival that was aired recently, he said. You shook your head. No, I'm pretty sure it's not that. You furrowed your brow. What's your name? You asked him. I'm Kaminari Denki, he replied with a welcoming smile. And you are? I'm Yin Lin, you replied back with the same courteous smile. His jaw fell open. Dude, it's her, Kaminari had called Karishima and Bakugo in a conference call the minute he left the store. Who's her, Karishima had asked. Yin, Kaminari yelled, almost jumping down the phone with excitement. Bakugo nearly dropped the phone when he heard your name. Where is she? He demanded. She works at the corner store around from school, Kaminari said, excitement still very evident in his voice. What well, did she say anything about me? Bakugo asked, trying not to sound too eager, but failing. Kaminari's face fell. Nah, dude, sorry, she didn't even recognise me, he said sadly. Bakugo snorted through the phone. That's because you don't matter. She would definitely recognise me. He puffed his chest out confidently. I'll see you tomorrow. I'll come too, Karishima added, jumping in at the last minute. Make that three then, Kaminari chuckled. I want to be there when Bakugo comes face to face with his girlfriend. She's not my girlfriend, dunce face. I don't even care about her, Bakugo snapped. That was a lie. He did care. He just didn't want to acknowledge it. I'm going. Bye. And with that, he hung up. What do you think, dude? Kaminari asked Karishma. Do you think she'll remember him? Uh, they swapped bodies for a long time, so I'm guessing she would. She knows his body better than any of us. That's true, Kaminari mused. Well, I guess we'll see tomorrow then. The fated day came and Bakugo was waiting impatiently for school to end. 
Why is this day taking so freaking long? He thought, tapping his pen angrily against his desk and glancing at the clock again. Time was slowing down. Well, that's what it felt like for him. He glanced at the door, signalling his desire to leave, but couldn't go anywhere. Finally, the bell rang and he stood abruptly and marched out the door, grabbing his bag from his locker before heading out the front door. Kaminari and Karishima scrambled to keep up, bags and books flying everywhere as they chased Bakugo down the hall. Where's the store? Bakugo asked abruptly, not looking at either Kaminari or Karishima. It's this way, just keep walking, dude, Kaminari encouraged, falling in step just behind and a little to the side of Bakugo, while Karishima was on the other side. All too soon they reached the store and Bakugo felt his nerves straining. He grit his teeth and balled his fists to try and keep the anxiety at bay. He hadn't really thought of anything to say to you, but he pushed the door open anyway, walking in purposefully with his chest out. He looked up at the boy trio and recognised Kaminari from the other day. Bought your boyfriends, I see, you quipped playfully. Bakugo marched over to you and leaned down on the counter, looking you dead in the eye. Oi, he growled. You looked his face over, knitting your brows in concentration. You'd seen this guy before. You tilted your head and squinted at him, his brilliant red eyes piercing your soul. Then it happened. A fuzzy feeling came over you and you couldn't feel yourself. And you started to blank. You tried to speak, but you couldn't, and your consciousness slipped slowly away as you fell into a seizure. You blacked out. Yin, Yin, are you okay? Your mum called to you. You opened your eyes and blinked at her, looking past her around the room. W where am I? You asked groggily. You, you're at the hospital, sweetheart. You had a seizure, she said softly, placing a hand on your arm. You thought back to what had happened just before you blacked out, and all you could remember were two red eyes staring at you. Those boys, you said, looking up at your mum. I was at the store and they just walked in. Yes, love, they called for help. I got their numbers so that you could thank them if you liked. She smiled at you. Thanks, Mum, you said, smiling back. She handed you a piece of paper with three names and numbers on it, and you read the names out loud. Kaminari, Krishma, and Bakugo. That last name on the list sounded so familiar. You frowned as you thought it. You sent them all a message that night to thank them for calling for help, and they all responded courteously, except for Bakugo, who just sent back, whatever, rude, you thought. I wonder which one he was. He's either the red-headed guy or the one with the brilliant red eyes. You sat there, pulling forth the image of his face, his brilliant red eyes staring into your soul, his masculine features and sharp, blonde, spiky hair. He was definitely good-looking, but his personality seemed a little arrogant. You felt another strange, fuzzy sensation and slipped under again, monitors beeping wildly. Bakugo was a mixture of pissed and elated. It was you, alright, but you didn't seem to recognise him. How dare you not recognise the guy that you had swapped bodies with for nine months? Or did you not care? Was that it? You had found someone better and just opted to ignore his very existence? He couldn't even fathom the thought. Why did he care though? You were just a quirkless nobody. You didn't even have a hot body. He certainly wasn't happy to have found you again. Or was he? Were you okay? Why did he even care? His emotions were in a blender, stirred and agitated. They simmered slightly though when he received a message from you thanking him for his help. She should be thanking me, I saved her, he had thought with a smirk, sending you back a very curt reply before tossing his phone on the bed. Why did he feel a pang of hurt though? Was he hoping to have continued to see you? Was he hoping you would have thrown yourself into his arms and told him how much you missed him? Had he missed you? You bet he had, but he wasn't about to admit that. That was a sign of weakness. Doctors rushed in from all directions when they heard the monitors beeping. You were having another seizure. During your seizure, you dreamed, or remembered, looking down at your body, but you had a rippling cut six pack. You looked up into the mirror and stared into two red glowing orbs. Then you woke up. Nurses were by your bedside, administering medication into your IV line, and you looked at them trying to make sense of the dream that you had. It felt familiar. While you were in hospital, Bakugo would walk past the store every afternoon on his way home, but you weren't there, so he would continue on angrily. The next week, you were back and working. He saw you through the window and walked in. You froze when you saw him. He's back again. What does he want this time? He watched you silently for a moment before walking off through one of the aisles. You tried to follow his movements with your eyes and ducked your head a little to watch him through the slats in the shelves. I wonder if he has a six pack, you thought remembering back to your dream. You shook your head. What the heck are you thinking, girl? Get your head out of the gutter. 
He grabbed a packet of spicy gum and walked purposefully to the counter. So you quickly busied yourself so it didn't look like that you had been watching him that whole time. Just these, he grunted, peering intently at you. Spicy, huh? You commented, picking up the pack of gum and scanning it. Yeah, he huffed. You like spicy stuff? Nah, you chuckled. Spicy's not for me. He just set his jaw and didn't say anything more, taking the gum that you'd handed to him before giving you one last look and heading for the door. Move, you extra, he growled to a fellow student that was trying to enter your store. Your head whipped up as you heard him say extra. You had heard that word before. You stared at the back of him as he walked away. He didn't look back. Bakugo's heart twisted in his chest. She doesn't remember me. Why doesn't she remember me? Why does it hurt that she doesn't remember me? His default scowl deepened. Should I tell her about us? What used to happen? Would she believe me? Bakugo's words played on your mind. You went to your grandma as soon as you got home and sat down next to her. Hey, grandma, you said nervously. Would you be able to tell me some of the things I did that was weird before? I remember you saying that I called my sisters something strange. What was it? You called them extras, she giggled. Not very nice, but still very comical. Extras, you yelped. Grandma, there was a guy that came into the shop today that used the same word. I've seen him in the shop once before and I feel like I've met him, but I don't know where. Could he be? Your grandma's eyes lit up. Sounds promising, dear. See if you can find out a little bit more about him. Well, he did buy spicy gum, he said, hoping that that piece of information would help. Well, yes, on the odd days, you would have spicy noodles for breakfast, your grandma said. Your eyes widened. Could he be the one? You said. Then your face fell. But he's such an asshole, Grandma. She laughed heartily. Oh, you only know him skin deep, dear. He might be better underneath. She winked. Or he could be rotten all the way through. You deadpanned. That's not very helpful. She cackled manically. Bakugo came to the store again the next day and bought another pack of spicy gum. Hey, um... I, I know I thanked you for helping me the other day, but I didn't catch your name, you said quietly, looking at your hands while you scanned his item. Bakugo. Bakugo Katsuki. You looked up at him. Have we met before? You asked. I seriously feel like I know you from somewhere. Bakugo looked like he was about to say something, but then stopped. No, don't think so, he said coldly before taking the gum and walking out. Your heart sank. Well... He hasn't mentioned anything about body swapping. I guess I should be grateful it's not him. He's rude. You remembered back to the thankful message you had sent to him at the hospital and how abruptly he had replied, Yeah, maybe the whole extra and spicy thing is just a coincidence, you shrugged. The following day he was back again. Is this guy for real, you thought? Another gum, you replied cheerily. Mm, he grunted. You took the gum and swiped it, handing it back to him and taking his change. Hey. You okay now? He asked gruffly. Me? Oh, I think so, he replied a little sheepishly. What's wrong with you anyway? He asked stiffly. What a rude way to ask such a delicate question, you thought. Um, I suffer from seizures, he said quietly, letting your gaze fall to the floor. I had an accident about four or five months ago now, and I've had them ever since. I got a significant amount of amnesia from the accident too. Bakugo flinched and his eyes widened slightly, but you didn't notice because you were still looking at the floor. Oh, he said, a little softer in tone than his usual gruff replies. Yeah, he said, glancing up at him before looking down again. Well, just take it easy, okay? Your head snapped up. He was looking at you softly. You furrowed your brows and cocked your head at him. He had done a complete 180 turn from his usual self. Wow, that was kind, you said, a little stunned. He scowled and clicked his tongue against his teeth. Whatever, you quirkless girl. Before you could ask how he knew that you were quirkless, he had walked out of the store in a huff. How does he know I don't have a quirk? You thought. The next few weeks were much the same. Bakugo would stop by every day and say maybe one or two sentences to you before storming off. It kind of became the norm. You were enjoying the job and your boss really liked how you handled the shop and was giving you longer and longer shifts. Finally, he gave you the closing shift, which required you to finish and lock up by 11pm. A late close, but you were elated that he trusted you enough to close up shop and keep the spare key. 
The day progressed as usual. Bakugo stopped by for more gum, and you now had an almost unspoken rule of having the gum that he liked waiting on the counter for him, so all he had to do was walk in and pay. He gave you a small nod before leaving this time, and you smiled, happy that you'd gotten more than just a grunt out of him. 11pm rolled around, and you did one last check of the shop to make sure it was tidy and free of spills on the floor, then turned off all the machines. You had just finished locking up the till when you felt your fingers go numb and fuzzy. Oh no, not now. Please not now. You froze and stared at the desk, panic setting in about the impending seizure that you knew was about to happen. You heard someone bang on the door and your head snapped up. It was back ago and he looked angry. Why the heck is he here? Why does he look so mad? You thought. You heard him yell something, but as you went to open your mouth to ask what he had said, you blacked out, tumbling to the floor and immediately going into a fit of spasms. Back ago knew immediately what was happening the second that he saw you freeze and brace yourself against the shop counter. Why was he outside the shop so late? He had had a premonition that something was going to happen and he just couldn't shake the feeling that you were somehow in danger so he wanted to check on you. He had timed it perfectly. When he saw you collapse he wasted no time in blasting the door down with his quirk. He quite enjoyed that part let's be honest and raced to your side. He quickly slid the hoodie off and folded it placing it under your head so it wouldn't, you wouldn't concuss yourself when your head was thrashing back and forth. He then moved stands and such away from you so that you wouldn't kick things over and then timed the seizures so you could give the relevant information to the correct medical staff. He reached for his phone and called the ambulance, directing the operator with excellent authority. Everyone he spoke to was very impressed with his skills. He watched the paramedics handle you and put you in the back of the ambulance. You had stopped convulsing by now and you were resting unconsciously. He watched them take you, and then turned and slowly headed for home. When you woke in the hospital, the last thing you remembered was seeing Bakugo at the door of the store. What happened to him? Why was he there? Was he mad at me? You picked up your phone that was placed on the stand next to the hospital bed and replied some frantic texts from your parents before flicking through your messages and pulling up your last interaction with Bakugo. You scowled when you saw it, but went ahead and sent him a new message. Your unhappiness at the previous texting interaction causing you to send a very short message this time around. Hey, thanks for calling the ambulance. You tapped out. Almost immediately a message came back. Yeah, okay. You frowned. How difficult is this guy being? Um, what were you doing outside the store so late? You probed. There was a bit more hesitation this time before the reply came back. Does it matter? I saved you, didn't I? Whoa. Yeah, it's true, but still, that didn't answer my question, you thought. You didn't really know where to go with this conversation, so decided to just let it go, since he was being so difficult. Yeah, true, thanks, you sent back, not caring if you came off as rude. He was being rude, wasn't he? Rest up, came his reply. Your eyebrows flew up in surprise. He acts all tough and uncaring, and then he says something surprisingly kind on the end. You shook your head. Why did he have to be like this? Another week went by and you went back to working. You were much more uh, you were more than a little curious about this Bakugo Katsuki who kept coming by without really saying much. You heard that he had paid your boss back for blasting the door off its hinges to get to you. You were quietly touched. Was he kind underneath after all? Hey, um, what school do you go to? You asked him one day. You should n he stopped. You a he said, looking away and shoving his hands in his pockets. I've heard of that school before, you said. Bakugo frowned, then softened. Come by sometime, he grunted before leaving. Come by? To his school? You blushed. Why would he want me to come to his school? You thought about his invitation and decided to take him up on his offer. The next afternoon, before, you, before work, you found your way to the school. Everything seemed so familiar. You walked to the front gates of the school and looked up. This place is huge, you thought, stepping onto the grounds. Your feet carried you through the building straight to the doors of Class 1A. You didn't know how you ended up there, but it all just felt so natural. The bell rang sharply and you jumped, looking left and right, wondering if you should hide. The door opened and a green-haired boy walked out, almost bumping into you. Oh, I'm sorry, Midoriya, you said. He stared at you. H how, how do you know my name? He stammered. You froze. How do I know his name? Bakugo was the next to exit the classroom and he stopped in his tracks. What are you doing here? He growled at you. You you told me to drop by, you stammered, taken aback by his rudeness. Wait, did he not mean school? Where else was I supposed to drop by, you thought. 
You step back, intending to make a run for it. You could feel the heat of embarrassment rising in your face, but his words stopped you short. You knew his name, didn't you? He said lowly, nodding to the still shocked and frozen green-haired boy. You nodded slowly. How do you know his name? Bakugo insisted, crossing his arms across his chest. I, I don't know, you replied, just as confused as the poor boy who you had correctly called Midoriya. Come here, Bakugo demanded, and you gingerly stepped towards him. Where do I sit? He asked, gesturing to the classroom of half-empty seats. How would I know where you sit? Just walk to my seat, he growled, giving you a sharp shove between your shoulder blades. You stumbled forwards and made your way down the aisles. What kind of a weird game is this? How the heck would I know where he sits? I've never been to this school before. You stopped, looking across at the seat by the window. You felt drawn to it, so you walked over and sat down. Bakugo's eyes widened. This one? You asked apprehensively. He nodded stiffly and your jaw dropped. He started walking down the aisle towards you and made his way over to the front of the desk, leaning down on it with both arms and staring into your eyes. You took a sharp breath in. Those red orbs were truly captivating. Do you remember anything yet? He asked slowly, his rich voice reverberating through you. I, what, remember anything? You asked, tilting your head to the side. Have I been here before? He just peered at you intently and you knitted your brows together, thinking deeply. He watched you as your brain ticked over. Suddenly your fingers started to tingle and your eyes widened in fright. But Bakugo, you said, fear rising in your voice. Do you remember something? He asked, a hint of hopefulness in his tone. N no, I, I think I'm... An attack is... He knew exactly what was going to happen and reached across the table and grabbed you in his arms, sco scooping you up and running for the door. He went rigid and started to fit, so he placed you down on the floor gently just outside the classroom door and hollered at the last of the students that were nearby to call for recovery girl, who was the on-site nurse. As you slipped into unconsciousness, you saw flashbacks of memories of the, this very school, conversations between yourself and other classmates. You called them by name and they responded. You were in a male uniform when you looked down. Why were you in a male uniform? When you woke up, you were in what looked like a holding bay for six students. You rolled your head to the side and Bakugo was sitting beside you, arms crossed, peering at you intently. You jumped slightly, not expecting him to be there. Bakugo, what's going on? You asked, clearly confused. He grunted and leaned forward, elbows on his knees. You want to know the truth? You nodded solemnly. Can you handle the truth? He smirked, remembering a similar line from a movie that he'd seen. Try me, you shrugged. He hung, he sighed and hung his head. <sighs> Where do I start? He mumbled. He started talking about how one day he woke up and he was in another person's body, how it seemed unbelievable, but yet it was happening. He told about the person's life, giving descriptions but no names, and you listened intently. But what does this have to do with me? You asked, trying to prop yourself up in the bed. Because the person's body I swapped with was yours. It happened for a good part of the year, and then it just suddenly stopped. You just stared at him. Okay, weird question, you said suddenly, but do you have a six pack? He snorted in surprise. What, this? He stood up and lifted his shirt with one hand, revealing an unbelievably well-toned set of abdominal muscles. Your jaw fell open. Okay, so that's a yes. Now I have an odd request, you said, sitting up slowly. Can, can you come over here for a second? He complied and you motioned for him to sit down on the bed. You scooted behind him and peeked over his shoulder, looking down at his abs. It was exactly the same view that you had seen in the strange deja vu dream type thing that you had had when you were unconscious after the seizures. You froze. I've seen this view before, you whispered. And did you like it? He said lowly with a sly grin, watching you from the corner of his eye. You pulled away quickly. Don't forget I've seen you topless too, he smirked, turning his, to face you on the bed. You're, you blushed and it deepened. D don't look at me without my clothes, you stammered with embarrassment. Eh, don't worry, you got nothing to brag about, he said dismissively. That hurt and you scowled. Well then leave me alone, alright? I'm obviously not your type, so stop appearing everywhere I go. Says the girl who's sitting in the nurse's office at my school, he sneered. I only came because you asked me to, you pouted. And you came, he said smugly. Plus, who said anything about a type? You know something more about this, don't you? He point, his pointed question caused you to get a little bit flustered and you backed up a bit, averting your eyes. He grabbed your ankles and pinned them to the bed. 
crawling up closer to you so that he could lock you down a bit. Talk, he commanded, his eyes burning into you. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Don't you dare lie to me, he sneered. I'm not stupid. I also heard about the soulmates thing. Your face flushed red and your heartbeat went wild. Okay, okay, you said, trying to remain as calm as possible. I spoke to my grandma. She mentioned something about soulmates swapping bodies. But that doesn't mean we're soulmates, you hollered at the end. He scoffed. Who wants to be a soulmate anyway? Who wants to be yours? You snorted back. There was an intense stare off with neither of you backing down until you finally growled. Let go of me. He obeyed, slightly embarrassed that he still had a hold of your ankles that whole time. Leave me alone, okay? You said, tears welling up in your eyes as you looked away. He caught the look on your face and softened slightly. Oi, I didn't mean... Just shut up, okay? You've done enough damage, you said, hurt by his the ruthless words. Like you were any more gentle with your words, he scoffed, hopping off the bed. You looked back up at him as he made a move to leave. You didn't want him to go. His company was actually really comforting, strangely enough. Wait, back ago, you said softly, fearful that he was going to leave without you making an apology. I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean what I said, you said, your gaze falling to the bed. He looked at you and then turned to walk out. I didn't mean what I meant, he said either. He called back as he walked straight out the door. Your eyes shut up. What? What part did he not mean, you thought? Sky was such a mystery. Your boss was starting to worry about you. You'd had a seizure at close up, then you didn't come to work because of another seizure. He couldn't rely on you like he thought he had, had been able to. At the next work day, he pulled you aside into his office to have the talk, regretfully letting you go. I just, I don't have anyone to cover you at the last minute if you don't show up for work, he said with a sigh. You were crestfallen, nodding sullenly in agreement. You thanked him for the time that you had spent there as his employee and left the shop heartbroken. That night you got a message from back ago. Heard you're not working at the store anymore, he said. Good news travels fast, huh? You replied back sarcastically. Why'd you get the flick? He asked, as blunt as ever. Because of my seizures, he replied back, just as frankly. It sucks, he replied. Well, at least he's being a bit sympathetic, you thought. Yeah, you typed, not really knowing what else to say. So that means you're free tomorrow then. He sent back, just as you were about to put your phone down. Yeah, I guess so. Why? Do you want me to come to your school and find your desk again for you? You typed back sarcastically. No, I want to take you somewhere. He replied back. Where? You asked. Come with me tomorrow after school and you'll see, he said. Meet me at the school gates, 3.15pm. You sent back a thumbs up and shook your head with a smile. This guy, you sighed and flopped back on your bed. You hadn't told your mum or grandma about discovering the truth behind Bakugo and yourself. You wanted to see how this would all play out first before telling them that you had found the person who was supposed to be your soulmate. At that moment, he was some really obnoxiously rude guy who happened to always be there for you at the most critical times in your life. You sighed heavily again. What were you going to do about him? Was he really your soulmate? The next afternoon, you met him at the UA school gates, and he walked with you down the road. So, are you going to tell me where we're going? You asked as he silently walked beside you. You tell me, he said slyly. What the heck is that supposed to mean, you quipped, a little angered. No, I'm serious, Yin. Pay attention to your surroundings. That was the first time that he had ever called you by your name. Usually it was just an oi or hey, or he'd just say something out of the blue and you knew it was directed at you. You fell silent and looked around you. These roads felt familiar, but you didn't know how to explain it. it. Must be my body remembering his world, you thought as you walked. A small cafe popped up in your vision, and you walked directly to it and pushed the doors open, Bakugo following you in, a slightly amused expression playing on his face. You looked around and walked over to a table and chairs by the window. You picked a table with three chairs, even though it was just you and Bakugo, Interesting choice, he said with an amused quirk of his eyebrow. Why'd you pick here? Uh, I don't know, he replied honestly. It's because when I come here after school, I come with Kaminari and Krishma, he said casually. This is the seat we choose mostly. You let a quiet, oh, slip and looked down at the menu. You want to order for me? He smirked. You looked up. You can't be serious, you said. Dead serious, he replied, leaning his chin down in his palm and locking eyes with you. That look, that stare that he used so often was starting to get you hot and bothered. 
Did he know what he was doing when he looked at you like that? Uh, okay, you said, biting your lip and looking back down at the menu. If I were back ago, what would I order? You thought. Oi. His voice snapped you out of your thoughts. Don't overthink it. You glanced up at him, then back down again. The waitress came over at that point and asked if she could take your order. You greeted her politely and placed your order, then glanced at Bakugo. He was still watching you intently and hadn't even acknowledged the waitress. Are you going to order? You asked him. You know what I want, he said in an almost provocative tone. His tone of voice was enough to make you and the waitress blush. Okay. Your eyes flicked across the menu and paused as they came across the spicy cutlets dish. Uh, the, um, spicy cutlets bowl, please? You said, looking up at the waitress. Sure, she said brightly, jotting it down before walking happily away. You looked over at Bakugo. <laughs> well done, he said with a smirk. So this is the somewhere you were talking about from before? You asked, slumping your chin in your hand. Yeah, he said, sitting back and taking a breath in. But I wanted to talk to you too. About what? You, he said calmly. You flinched. What about me? Well, I know your life up until the accident. What happened exactly? He asked, leaning forward on the table again and giving you his full attention. You sighed and launched into what happened during the accident, giving him extra information from what your grandma, parents and siblings had told you during those times that you didn't remember. He listened intently. He was very interested in what you had to say, even though you thought it was useless information. You got to the part about what the specialist had said and his interest peaked that little bit more. Wait, so the seizures are caused by me then? He said. Not the accident? No, well, it's not caused by you, but it's just because we're connected. But the connection had been broken, so my body spazzes every so often. He grunted. Is there any way to fix this? Uh, not sure, you replied, looking up and thinking. But I see the specialist at the end of this week, so I'll ask him more about it then. Okay, fair enough, he said, sitting back. He paused and looked at you for a moment. I wanted to show you this, too. He reached into his pocket and pulled his phone out then opened notes and pushed the phone across the table to you. What's this? you asked, reading through the first few lines. Did I write this? Yeah, he said. We used to keep each other informed about what was happening in each other's lives, so we could keep on top of things. You read a bit more before looking up at him. Could I please have a copy of this? He eyed you before nodding. Send yourself a copy. You did, making a mental note to read it that night. You chatted a bit more about other random things before exiting the shop. He walked you home before saying a curt goodbye and leaving. You went straight to your room to read the messages that you had sent yourself a copy of. You were starting to get more and more curious about this guy. Maybe he's not too bad underneath it all, you thought. You curled up on your bed and opened the messages of notes that you had sent yourself from his phone. The first few seemed to come from a place of anger and confusion, which you understood completely. Any person in that situation would be angry and confused. Then the messages started to get more logical and helpful. You smiled when you realised that you and he had started signing off the notes with See you in two days, as it appeared that this happened every two days. You got to the very last note. It was from Bakugo, filling you in on the happenings at school and telling you that he'd see you tomorrow. It was dated the day before your accident. The swap never came. Rereading the messages made it clear to you now why the guy was finding himself drawn to you. Even if he may not particularly have an attraction to you, there was still a part of him that was connected to you for those nine months. It would be hard to let go of something like that that you'd been so intimately intertwined with. You sighed and rolled onto your back, thinking about everything that you'd just read. Your phone dinged in your hand and you lifted it up to see who it was. It was Bakugo. You smiled. Read the notes? He asked. Yeah, you replied. What'd you think? Ah, uh, interesting, you sent back. I'm not really sure what else to say right now. Fair enough, came the reply, and that's where it stopped. This back ago seemed like he was interested. He cared, albeit a weird type of caring, but he'd always check in on you. He wasn't a man of many words, but he still got his point across. You fell asleep that night dreaming about him. The day came for your appointment with the specialist, and you had so many questions for him. You waited nervously in the waiting room for him to call for you. Finally, he appeared and beckoned you into his office. Yin, how have you been? He asked, glancing down at the clipboard with your information on it. I see you've still been having the seizures. Yeah, I have, you replied. But I think I found the guy that I was swapping bodies with. I still have episodes when I meet him. But since we've spoken about the body swaps, I haven't had any more. Does that mean they'll stop now? 
He scratched his cheek and looked away slightly. Have you two kissed? What? You squeaked, putting your hand over your mouth. No? Well, it'll probably keep continuing then, he said, grimacing slightly. Wait, so you're saying I need to... We need to kiss? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying, he said brightly. Like he hadn't just told you to kiss the rudest guy you know. You need to realign the DNA connection. Saliva contains DNA, so this is the easiest transfer. Unless... Unless what? You asked, leaning forward in your seat, hoping he had an alternative. No, you're too young for that, he said, dismissing the thought with a hand wave. Too young for what? You asked. You still didn't know what he was talking about. The transfer of body fluids, he said, deadpanning. Like surgery? You asked naively. No, Yin, I'm talking about intercourse. You screamed. The minute you left the specialist's office, your phone dinged. Bakugo was wanting to know how you went. Should we meet in person? You asked. There's a lot to cover. Yeah, okay. At the cafe we went to last time. Meet me 3.30pm, he replied. You sent a thumbs up back to him and made your way to your mum's car. 3.30pm came by and you pushed open the doors of the cafe. Bakugo was there at the table that you had sat at before and he gave you a small head nod and lounged back, draping his arm across the back of the chair beside him. You made your way over, a little nervously, and sat down opposite him. So what did the specialist say? He said, point blank. You laughed lightly. No pleasantries? He shrugged. We definitely know each other well enough by now. Why? Why would we waste time with pleasantries? Your heart leapt at the sentence. Um, okay, you replied with. Well, the specialist said that it would just go away on its own. You looked down at your hands and fiddled with your fingers. Bakugo watched you, his eyes searching your face. Finally, he spoke. Is that exactly what the specialist said, or is that the conclusion you've come to? He leaned forward on the table. I want to know exactly what the specialist said. You looked down, keeping your head down low. D don't worry about it, Bakugo. It's really nothing. It's not a big deal. Okay, one, I'm not worried about it. I just asked the question. I'm waiting for the answer. Two, does this disrupt your life? Yes, then it's a big deal. You kept your head down. Why is he being so forceful about this, you thought. Now, you going to tell me what the specialist said? He asked again, his voice low and commanding. You glanced up at him. I don't really want to talk about it, you said bashfully. You said in your text that there was a lot to cover, and now that you get here you don't want to talk, he said, frustration evident in his voice. Fine, if you're going to be like that, I'll leave. He got up and walked to the door, but your hand on his arm stopped him. Wait, back you go, please wait. You gripped his arm a little tighter, your head hanging down so that your fringe covered your eyes. He turned to face you and placed a finger under your chin to raise your head. You let him, but you kept your eyes averted. Something's wrong, he said. What's wrong? I'm embarrassed about what the specialist said to me, you stuttered. He told me how I could fix the seizures. Bakugo's eyes widened and he tilted his head slightly to catch your eye. You looked at him. What is it? How can you fix it? You swallowed thickly, your heart pounding in your chest. He... Bakugo waited his brilliant crimson orbs piercing into your eyes, holding you captivated. You dared not move. He said that if we kissed, it would stop. Bakugo didn't flinch. He stayed still, holding your chin, looking at you intently. Your face was flushed, heart beating wildly. I can do that, he said lowly, his voice dropping, his eyes laced with an unknown emotion. No way, you said suddenly, pulling your head away from him. I, I don't just want this to be any kiss. I've never kissed a guy before, so I don't want my first kiss to just be because you took pity on me. I, I want it to be a true, a, a real kiss. Bakugo opened his mouth and closed it again. He just looked at you for the longest time before turning and walking out silently. You let go of the breath that you had inadvertently been holding and let it out as a sigh. What have I done now? Why is he mad? Why is there so much friction between us? You dropped your head again and went back to your chair to grab your things before walking sullenly to the door. You trudged home, replaying what had just happened in your mind. Could I have said things differently? Should I have just let him kiss me? You got home and flopped into bed, falling asleep the minute that your head hit the pillow. You woke up with a start around 10pm. Your phone was ringing loudly by the bedside and you quickly grabbed it and answered it. Hello? You said, your voice a little raspy from sleep. Did I wake you? A male voice said from the other end. Uh, no, no, I was, um, I was just having a nap, but it's all good. What the hell are you doing napping at this late? You should be asleep at this time, the voice said. 
Back ago? Yeah, he finally asked, finally realising who it was you were talking to. Who else would it be? He shot back. What do you want? You asked, ignoring his previous question. There was a brief moment of silence and his voice came through the line. Uh, I know it's late, but could I see you now? Now? You yelped. I'm, mm, I'm outside your house, he said, slightly embarrassed. What? Listen, just come out here, would you? I need to tell you something, he replied. He sounded anxious and nervous all at the same time. Okay, I'll be out in a sec, you said, then hung up. You quickly threw a jumper on and crept out of your room to the front door. Everyone else was asleep. They must have only just gone to bed, you thought. Once outside, you quickly ran to the front gate. Bakugo was leaning up against the wall, just outside, and was waiting for you to appear. Hey, you greeted him curiously. Why are you here so late? Actually, can I apologise for today? You started to say something, but then he grabbed you by the arm and yanked you towards him, spinning you around and pinning you against the wall, both hands either side of your head. The street lights were throwing just enough light to catch the light in his eyes, and you caught flashes of red every now and again as his gaze shifted across your face. Listen to me now, okay? He commanded, and you fell silent. I'm not good with showing emotions, he said, hanging his head. I didn't like the swapping bodies with you at first, but then it almost became natural. He shifted slightly and looked up at you, his face getting closer to yours. I started to really like you. His voice dropped low and his eyes flicked to your lips then back up again and you bit your lip. I know you said you wanted your first kiss to be a real kiss. You nodded and his face came a little closer to yours. You could feel his hot breath mingling with yours. He leaned in a little closer and your breathing hitched. Wait, back you go, wait, you breathed, placing your hands on his heaving chest. But I don't know if I feel the same way. He pulled back sharply. You don't? He sounded hurt, a pained look coming across his face. Well, I, I don't really know. I, I'm not sure yet, you responded, confused by your own feelings. I misread this whole situation then, he growled in frustration, angry that he had shown his true emotions, only to have it thrown back in his face. He still stayed caging you in though, he had had his head turned away from you in embarrassment. But I need to ask, do, do you actually like me? I thought you said that I was flat and nothing to, I know what I said before, and I told you I didn't mean it, he interjected through gritted teeth, glancing at you from the corner of his eye. What I said was supposed to diffuse the situation, make you feel more comfortable about the fact that I'd seen you naked. What? It would have been better if I'd said that you were hot? You would have called me a perv and freaked out. You looked down. Oh, he said softly. Yin, I like you. A lot. You looked back up at him. He had looked away again and had a deep scowl on his face. You sighed again. I'm sorry, Bakugo. I know you've put your emotions on the line. He took a step back and shoved his hands in his pockets, blinking furiously a few times to hold back the tears that were springing up in the corners of his eyes. Damn, why am I crying? This is so embarrassing. This is why it's bad to get attached to anyone. He turned to walk away, but you grabbed him. Wait, don't leave. Why? If you don't like me, then I should probably go. Leave you be, he said, his words sounding hurt, and his words hurting you. Why did they sting like that if you didn't like him? I... I never said I didn't like you, I just don't know. You hung onto his sleeve. He turned and caught your lips against his swiftly, and you stiffened in surprise, but the contact was definitely welcomed by your body, and the next second you were kissing him back just as fervently as he was kissing you. He pushed you back up against the wall and held you there, his hands wandering your body firmly yet gently. He didn't touch anywhere that was inappropriate, but he definitely made it known that he liked what he was feeling. His lips parted slightly and his tongue brushed your bottom lip. A tingle rushed through your core and you parted your lips in response, allowing him to slip his tongue into your mouth and intertwine it with yours. You wrapped your arms around his neck and pulled your body against his, his hands slipping to your hips and he encouraged the contact. Your brain went fuzzy and a ringing sounded clear and loud in your ears. Suddenly bursts of light flashed in your vision, but you were too captivated by his kiss to pay attention to what was going on around you. The kisses were getting hotter and more passionate, a carnal need fueling the aggression behind the movements of his lips and tongue. He groaned softly as you upped the pace, wanting him as much as he was wanting you. You'd never kissed anyone before, but this just felt so right. Suddenly your head spun and you pulled away, grabbing for your temples. Oi, what's wrong? he asked breathlessly. Yin. You were still holding your head, a strong grimace expression on your face. It's... 
Are you going to have another attack? He asked, holding you by the shoulders. He looked you over. No, this is different to the seizures. Yin, talk to me, he encouraged, bending his head to try and get a better look at you. I, I can see everything, you repri replied brokenly. His voice was penetrating your thoughts. Flashbacks and dialogue from the time that you were in his body burst through your mind. Everything was coming back. You were remembering everything about the body swaps. Back you go, he breathed. Yes, he asked. I remember. I remember you, you exclaimed excitedly, the strange sensation subsiding in your brain. You looked up at him. I remember. I remember the body swaps. I remember everything. Your face broke out into a wide smile and you threw your arms around him. Thank you. Thank you so much, you cried into his neck. He hugged you close and hid his smile into your shoulder, staying quiet as you rejoiced. Do you feel okay? He asked, pulling back to look at you. Yes, yes, I feel perfect. I feel too good, you giggled. Bakugo, thank you, thank you. You hugged him again. Wait, you pulled back, your face falling. Do, do you actually like me or did you lie so that you could help me? Bakugo looked offended. How could you ask that? After all, I just said and did. No, no, I just thought that you might have made it up to help me, you said, saddened that you might have hurt him again. Okay, listen, he said, grabbing you by the shoulders. I like you a lot. I'm attracted to you. I think you're hot, okay? I'm glad I was able to help you. And I also got to kiss you too, which is what I'd been wanting to do for ages. At this point, I'm okay if you don't like me back. I guess I can live with that, he said, scratching his cheek and glancing away. You stepped back in and forced him to look at you. No, Bakugo, I definitely like you, he said, leaning back in and planting your lips on his again. I'd be stupid to let my soulmate go like that, you smiled coyly. He smirked. Be careful what you say. With the way I'm feeling about you right now, we'll be more than just soulmates. Your face went bright red. After one last heated kiss, you said goodbye and headed back inside, your mind swirling with all the newly remembered information that you had just received. You slept well that night and awoke the next morning bright and energised. You bounded down the hall to the kitchen and greeted your family warmly. Your two sisters, parents and grandma all looked at you strangely. It was almost as if you had been transported back to before the accident. They hadn't realised how much you had changed after the accident, but that kiss last night from back ago turned your world upside down for the better. You're awfully spirited today, Yin, your mum commented. Mm-hmm, you hummed happily in response. Any particular reason? Your dad asked with a curious smile on his face. You stopped what you were doing and looked over at your family, who were all waiting expectantly for your reply. You grinned from ear to ear. I found him! You practically squealed. Your grandma was the first to catch on and she jumped up, well, as best she could, and hobbled over to give you a hug. Oh, Yin dear, that's fantastic! She squeezed you tightly as tears of happiness pricked at the corner of her eyes. Found who? Your dad asked, thoroughly confused. You know how the specialist said something about my body possibly swapping with my soulmate and I was acting weird for a bit there? Your dad nodded. Well, I found him, you said excitedly, bouncing up and down on your heels lightly. His face fell. Is this the same person who would swear at us and call your sisters extras? You paused momentarily. Uh, yeah. And he almost got you expelled at school because of his behaviour in your body? You hung your head. Um, yeah. Well, honey, to be perfectly honest with you, I'm disappointed that this person is supposed to be your soulmate because he sounds like a terrible person to me, he said, anger and indignation evident in his voice. I don't care if you found him. I want you to tell him never to see or speak to you again. But dad, he's not that bad. I know what he used to be like, but once you get to know... No, I don't want to hear another word about this, your dad said turning away from you and pulling his newspaper up to signal the end of the conversation. You looked at your mum. She gave you an apologetic look. I'm sorry, honey, but I agree with your father. That person that you were swapping with was positively awful. Tears welled up in your eyes and your stomach churned. You looked at your sisters. I didn't like it when you were mean to me and called me an extra, Mika said, pouting. Same here, Zura said. I don't like this guy. You need to find a different, better soulmate. Tears rolled down your cheeks and you fled from the kitchen back to your room. Why did they all hate him? Why couldn't they see him how you saw him? Sure, he was abrupt and rude at times, but he really did have a good heart underneath. 
You flung your door open and flopped down on your bed, burying your face into your pillow and sobbing. You were crying so hard you didn't hear your grandma enter and sit down beside you. Her thick but gentle hand on your back was the first indicator that someone else was present in your room and you jumped violently. Grandma, you said, startled. Sorry, I, I didn't hear you come in. You sniffed, tears still streaming down your cheeks. Yeah, my sweet. Please don't pay any attention to your parents or siblings. They only know this boy's skin deep, but you see deeper than that. It'll take them some time to come around, but I'm sure they'll come to like this boy, she said softly in her sweet elderly voice. But what do I do now, Grandma? They hate him. What do I tell him? Do I continue to see him behind their backs? Your grandma chuckled lightly. You are only young once, dear child. Some things are worth being rebellious for, she winked at you. If you need me to cover for you for any reason, just know that I will be happy to do so. You pulled yourself up and fell into her arms. Thank you so much, Grandma. I don't know what I'd do without you, you sobbed. She chuckled again and patted your head. You're a sweet girl, and I trust your judgment of this guy. What is his name? Bakugo Katsuki, Grandma, and I'd really love for you to meet him, you said, feeling much better after the pep talk from Grandma. We'll have to arrange it sometime then, she smiled. Now, no more tears. You go and have some breakfast and continue to see him. I will keep it a secret from your parents and siblings. You grinned from ear to ear and bounced off the bed. Your grandma watched you go inside. Ah, Yin, don't be like me. Don't let go of your soulmate because people tell you you should. She shook her head sadly, rising slowly from her seat. She walked to the door and headed after you, back down to the hall and to the kitchen. Images from her own life flashing through her mind. The body swaps with the boy her age and never chasing it up. I wonder what he's doing now, if he's still alive. I'm too old to try and pursue him, she thought. She rubbed her back as she made her way down to the kitchen entrance. Everyone seemed to have forgotten about the intense conversation that happened only moments before and she smiled. I'm grateful for this family, I truly am. She sat at the table and continued her breakfast, the image of a boy smiling at her remaining in her thoughts. I hope you are well, Sorohiko. Your phone vibrated in your pocket. Want to meet up today? It was back ago. Sure, you replied, smiling at your phone. Usual cafe? Yeah, he replied. See you 3.30. You closed your phone and slid it back into your pocket, smiling happily to yourself. Your smile vanished instantly, though, when you realised that you were going to have to have an excuse to leave the house and go out, and your parents were certainly not keen on you seeing Bakugo as your reason. You paused in the hallway and pondered a minute, your grandma seeing you stop through the open door of her room. Yen dear, she called sweetly. Would you be a darling and drop down to the shops to get some things for me? You turned to look at her, about to tell her that you had other plans, but the twinkle in her eye stopped you. She smiled cheekily and beckoned you in with her crooked finger. You wandered into her room, eyebrows raised quizzically. What's my dear old grandma scheming now, you thought. You're needing an excuse to go and see your Bakugo, are you not? She whispered cunningly. Use the excuse that I've asked you to get some stuff. She winked. I don't care if you don't bring me back anything, she chuckled. Just go and have fun. A wide grin spread across your face and you engulfed her in a bear hug. Grandma, you're the best, you squealed quietly into her knitted top. She chuckled again and patted your head. Go, sweet girl, don't let them ruin your fun. She was referring to your family's disapproval of Bakugo. You smiled and nodded, trotting out of her room and heading for the door. Mom, you called into the kitchen. I'm going to grab some things for Grandma, okay? Okay, hon, be back for dinner, she called back. You said you would, and you skipped out the door. Bakugo was waiting for you at the cafe entrance, leaning back casually against the wall of the building, with one foot cocked up and pressed against the wall with his arms crossed across his chest. You inhaled sharply at the sight. Oh, he just gets hotter each time I see him, you thought. Hey, he greeted you with a slight head nod. You replied his greeting with a giant smile and a quiet, hey, before following him inside. You want to order for us? He asked, leaning back in the chair and draping his arm across the empty seat beside him, crimson eyes watching you intently. 
do you always have that intense stare? You asked with a giggle. Yeah, sure, I can order. I like what I'm seeing, he responded coolly. Can't I observe what I like? Your heart skipped a beat. Uh, oh, <laughs> you giggled, covering your mouth. He smirked, head tilting down. Am I coming on too strong? Oh, uh, no, uh, I'm just not used to it, you said, your brain desperately trying to focus on the menu and not Bakugo's flirtatious lines. We made light talk for a bit, and then he asked a question that had been on his mind since he first met you. So what now? He asked, taking a big mouthful of spicy noodles. What do you mean, what now? You asked, taking a sip of your drink. He swallowed most of the mouthful before replying, with some of it shoved in his cheeks. Well, do you want to make this official? What, us? You asked, tilting your head. Yeah, us, he replied, twirling his fork in the bowl, readying for another mouthful. I would really like that, but there seems to be a few hiccups on my end, you said sullenly. Like what? He asked gruffly. Like my parents remembering your antics when you were in my body and they've made up their mind that they don't like you? He threw his head back and laughed. Old hags, he said, laughing manically. Like I give a damn if they like me or not, he said, digging into his bowl again. Your heart sank. Bakugo, you may not like my parents, but I'm quite close with them, and although I'm not supposed to be seeing you today, I do respect their thoughts and wishes. He looked up at you and stopped chewing, a mischievous smirk pulling at his lips. So you snuck out, you deviant, he mumbled through his mouthful. No, I didn't sneak out, you retorted, crossing your arms across your chest and knitting your brows together. My grandma covered for me, you replied, a smirk also pulling at your lips. <laughs> awesome grandma, he said smugly. I always liked her. She seemed to know what was going on. I'm pretty sure she did know from the beginning because she had a body swapping experience when she was younger too. She did? Bakugo asked, his crimson eyes gleaming with curiosity. She marry a soulmate? You looked down disappointedly. No, unfortunately. She said she doesn't regret it, but she often thinks about what could have been. That's why she's helping me to see you. Bakugo studied you silently. Well, not letting go of you anyway, now that we're together again. So we're getting married. Parents approval or not. Your eyes shot up and met his. But married? You stammered. Yeah, he smirked. When we're old enough. But I'm definitely making you mine. Your heart thumped in your chest. He's so sure. You smiled and covered your mouth to hide your happiness. That smile tells me you're happy with my decision, he commented, winking at you before taking another mouthful. You tried to get the rest of your food down, but the butterflies in your stomach wouldn't allow much to go down. When you left the shop, he grabbed your hand and spun you around into him. I've been wanting to kiss you ever since I saw you today, he said lowly, ducking his head to the side of your neck and kissing you gently. You squeaked with excitement and nuzzled into him, wrapping your arms around his neck. Don't worry about your folks, he whispered. I'll turn him around. His lips caught yours as you turned to say something to him, and the same type of kiss that happened that first time you two locked lips happened again. He was a commanding person and his hot kisses made your body obey. You melted into him as he held you. Come on, he said, pulling away. I'll walk you home. As you rounded the corner for your home, you saw your sisters playing in the front yard. Back and go, wait, you hissed. Here is fine. My sisters will see you. Like I give a damn if they see me, said, strolling purposefully forward. Wait, you whispered harshly again, pulling on his elbow. No, he shot back, walking right up to the gate. What's up, extras? He snarled, a mischievous grin on his face as he leaned up against the iron, arms up above his head. Mika and Zura looked up at him and knew who he was immediately. You hung back, not knowing what to do, panicking internally. What are you doing here? Zura huffed little hands on her hips. You're supposed to be staying away from Yin. Correction, squirt. She's supposed to be staying away from me, but she can't because we're meant to be. He smiled smugly, and there's nothing you can do about it. Now look, let's be honest. You loved that he was so sure of himself and that he wasn't afraid to stand up for you and admit his feelings openly, but he really wasn't helping the situation. You smacked your hand to your face and groaned. Back and go. What are you doing? He looked over at you. I'm telling them how it is. Yes, I can see that, you responded sarcastically, but you're not helping with this whole thing. He pushed off the gate and walked back to you. What do you want me to do? Beg for their acceptance? He scoffed. That ain't me. If they can't accept me for who I am, then so be it. 
but that doesn't change anything about how I feel about you. You blushed as he pulled you into him sharply, and then he kissed you on the lips. Ew, came Mika's little voice from the gate. You peered past him to see her tiny face pressed between the bars, watching you two. You giggled. Okay, look, let's just leave it for now. I'll come up with an idea on how to get everyone to meet you and like you, hopefully. He shrugged. Like I said, you're mine. End of story. You smiled and pecked him on the lips again before running past him to the gate and letting yourself in. You glanced back at him one last time and smiled internally Then, when you saw him watching you with that same hungry stare that he always adopted around you. You then ushered your sisters inside and followed suit. You were wondering if you should ask them to keep it quiet about back ago, but before you could say anything, Mika screamed into the hall. Mom, Yin was kissing the boy that calls us extras and swears a lot. Oh, great. You rolled your eyes. Here it comes. She was what? You heard your mum reply. You grimaced. Yin, come here, please, she called out to you. Oh, you're in trouble now, Zura said in a sing-song type of warning. You sighed and set your jaw, preparing for the onslaught. You walked sullenly into the kitchen and faced your mum, who was standing there with her hands on her hips. Were you with that boy? She asked accusingly. Yes, I was, he replied, your gaze falling to the floor, shifting your weight nervously. What did I just tell you the other day? She said with an annoyed ex exasperation in her voice. You were about to reply when there was a knock on the door. You looked up, confused. Who could that be? You thought. Zura skipped to the door and opened it, and you leaned out the doorway to see who it was, your heart dropping when two crimson eyes locked with yours the minute that your sister opened the door. Oh no, you screamed internally. He must have seen the look on your face and smirked. Don't be so happy to see me, he said sarcastically. You didn't move or say a word. Who is it, Zura? Your mum asked. Trouble, was all she replied with, and you groaned loudly. Your mum walked into the hall and saw Bakugo. Can I help you? She asked him. Maybe not, he said curtly, but I'm here to support my girlfriend. I'm sorry, you're who? The most beautiful girl in this house, he responded with, smirking at your mum and crossing his arms across his chest. Oh, he must mean me, your grandma interjected, hobbling out of her room and down the hall. What fun am I missing? You grinned internally, the fear inside you subsiding now that grandma had joined the fray. Please come in, darling, your grandma said to Bakugo, pushing your mother aside gently to let the boy inside. What's up, grandma? He greeted her with a big grin. Been ages since I saw you. Good to see you're still alive. You flinched slightly at his directness, but grandma seemed to like it. Alive and kicking, young man. Make yourself at home, she said, ushering him into the lounge room. She turned and looked at everyone who were still frozen in their respective places. Well, come on, you extras. Come into the lounge room. We need to chat. Bakugo cackled manically from the lounge room. Can I adopt you? You heard him ask your grandma. Am I supposed to be his soulmate or is she? You smiled and shook your head. There was an awkward exchange between Bakugo and your mum. She wasn't impressed with him and he could tell. Bakugo didn't make any excuses for himself, though. He was who he was, and he didn't make changes for anybody. He did his best to refrain from swearing, however, which you appreciated greatly. Then your father walked in. He felt the tension immediately and seemed to know who Bakugo was straight away. What are your intentions with my daughter? Your father asked him directly, standing over him in a dominant display of fatherly protectiveness. Bakugo stood up and got right up in your father's face. You covered your mouth to stop the nervous squeal that threatened to escape. I'm in love with your daughter, sir, he spat. She's my soulmate. Nothing's going to change my mind on that. She'll be mine forever. Your heart was thumping in your chest. Bakugo was right up in his face. They looked like two fighters trying to intimidate each other before a match. Finally, your dad backed down without a word. Now I'll take the grandma too, because she's awesome, Bakugo added with a dead straight face, still staring your father down. After the awkward encounter, Bakugo left, not without reminding you again that he wasn't going to let anyone get in the way of you and him being soulmates, and you smiled as you closed the door. He was indeed ferociously protective of you now, and it was kind of nice to feel so wanted. Your parents didn't say much more to you that night, and Grandma promised you that things would work out. You hoped they would. As you were hopping into bed, a soft knock at your door brought your attention. Come in, 
you called, wondering who it was so late at night. Your sister, Zura, pushed the door open and popped her head through. Can, can I come in? She asked shyly, scratching the door with her fingers. Sure, you invited her, curiosity getting the better of you. What's up? Zura was four years younger than you. She was 12 and you were 16. Not a huge age gap, but enough for her to see you as almost like a mother figure at times. Sis, can I ask you something? You nodded. Do you love Bakugo? She asked, fiddling with her fingers and looking down at her hands. Um, yeah, I do, I, th I think, you replied. Why do you ask? Um, well, how do you know if you love someone? She asked curiously, quickly walking to your bed and curling up on it, looking up at you with puppy dog eyes. That's a good question, Zura, you pondered a bit before replying. Well, I feel really happy when I'm with him and he makes me feel safe. Just like when I'm with you and mum and dad and Mika and grandma, she exclaimed excitedly. You giggled. Yeah, that's right. He looks really strong and mean, she said quietly. Does that mean he'll protect you from any baddies? You laughed. I know he looks mean, but he's really nice underneath it all. You just need to get to know him a little bit, that's all. Zura smiled and sat up. When he looks at you, it looks like he's looking at his favourite food, she said confidently. You laughed. It was refreshing to hear what it looked like from your 12-year-old sister's perspective. What does it look like when I look at him? You asked her. You look like this. And she pulled a very bashful and shy look, scrunching herself into a ball and covering her mouth. Well, it's close, you giggled. Next time he's here, you tell him that he looks at me like he's looking at his favourite food and see what he says. She giggled. Okay, she said brightly. I know mum and dad don't like him at all, but I'm actually happy that you found someone you like, she said, bounding off the bed. When you get married next year, I want to be the flower girl. Next year, you said. It's not going to be next year. Well, it might be, she retorted. By the way he talks, it could be tomorrow. You laughed. Okay, you've made your point. Night, sis. Night, night, she said brightly as she skipped out of the room and down the hall. You got up and shut your door, shaking your head with a smile before falling into bed. Hey, I want you to meet my folks. You froze, phone in hand, eyes rereading and rereading the message from Bakugo that he had just sent you the next day. Um, okay, you replied hesitantly. Yeah, tonight. What? Get Grandma to wingman you. You chuckled at his last message and quickly snuck to Grandma's room. Grandma? You called softly, knocking gently on the door as you pushed it open. Yes, dear? She asked as your head appeared in her doorway. Bakugo wants me to meet his parents, but I need an excuse to go out. You left your question open, letting Grandma guess the rest. That all too familiar twinkle graced her eye and she chuckled lightly. You want me to cover for you? You nodded sheepishly. Well, I would love to, dear, but I have one problem. What's that, Grandma? You asked, sadness filling your reply. I would like to go with you, so I won't be able to cover for you, she said, a big smile on her beautifully wrinkled face. I'll tell your parents I'm taking you out. Is this going to work? Why do you want to meet his parents? What are you up to? You threw question after question at her. She laughed. Relax, sweetheart. It's going to be fine. Okay, if you say so, you replied dubiously. I'll let Bakugo know what's happening. You looked down at your phone and typed something to him. His reply came back instantly. He says you're always welcome, Grandma, you said with a smile. She chuckled. He's a fine man, Yin. I look forward to meeting his parents. You and Grandma managed to get out of the house without any hiccups and headed down the road to Bakugo's house. He was a keen bean and met you halfway, walking back to his house hand in hand with you. This was actually the first time that he'd ever held your hand and you noticed it was a little sweaty. Are you nervous? You whispered to him. No, he replied, almost offended that you would imply such a thing. Why are your hands sweaty then? You asked him, shaking his hand slightly to draw his attention to it. He hurriedly pulled his hand away and wiped it on his pants. It's part of my quirk, he mumbled. That's why I don't like holding hands much. I don't mind though, he replied bashfully. I, I like holding your hand. You reached for his hand again and he begrudgingly let you take it, scowling slightly but enjoying your soft small hand in his. He made light conversation with your grandma and before long you found yourself outside his house. You didn't think that you'd be nervous but all of a sudden butterflies rose in your stomach. I've met his parents before when I was in his body but 
how will they react to me in my own body? Do they know about the swaps and the whole soulmates thing, you thought? All these questions would be answered very soon. Bakugo walked up to his front door and opened it, pulling you along behind him. Oi! Old hag, he bellowed through the front door. Got some people I want you to meet. Listen, you useless child, you need to be more polite in front of guests, came the reply. You recognised the voice immediately as his mother's. She rounded the corner and looked at you and your grandma. Well, hello, friends of Katsuki. Please call me Mitsuki. She smiled brightly and walked forward to shake your and your grandma's hands. She reached for yours and saw Bakugo was holding your hand. Her demeanour changed instantly. Oh, she said slyly, more than friends I see, she said, shooting Bakugo a devilish smile. Shut it, Bakugo growled. Let's go to the lounge room so I can explain everything. Mitsuki raised her eyebrow at her son, but let him lead the way, falling in step with your grandma and chatting lightly to her. Bakugo plopped down on the lounge and dragged you down next to him, letting go of your hand and wrapping his arm across your shoulders. You tentatively placed a hand on his knee and felt him stiffen slightly, so you glanced at him. You okay? Is it too much? You whispered quickly, gently squeezing your fingers into his leg to indicate that you were asking about your placement of your hand on his leg. It's fine, he muttered back. It's just your touch is making me lose my cool. You blushed madly and looked away slightly as Mitsuki and your grandma walked into the room and found seats, sitting down comfortably. Mitsuki looked over to you two and visibly stifled a giggle. You two look like an old married couple. She gestured to the way that you were sitting, his arm around you and your hand on his knee. You chuckled shyly. It's because she's my soulmate, Bakugo said frankly. Mitsuki coughed. Sorry, I'm not mad or anything. I just, it's great, but what the hell is going on? Uh, okay, where do we start? You said, tilting your head to the side and looking at Bakugo. I got this, he said, squeezing his shoulder. Okay, do you remember a while back I'd act weird every so often? He asked his mum. Yes, she laughed manically. It was hilarious. Every second day you'd act like a girl. Yeah, it's because I was one, he replied gruffly. It was her, he pointed at you. Mitsuki let out a confused laugh. Sorry, I don't follow. Your grandma spoke up. Mitsuki, love. This is before your time, but maybe you might have heard of a body swapping phenomenon that happened nationwide about 80 years ago? Mitsuki shook her head. No, actually, I don't remember hearing anything like that. Your grandma continued. Well, 80 years ago, there were a number of, number of people that experienced swapping bodies with the person that they would become their life partner with. Mitsuki co cocked her head. This phenomenon still continues today, just to a lesser extent. Mitsuki looked at you and Bakugo. Is this what happened to you two? You nodded. One day I woke up and I was still me, but I was inside his body. Her mouth fell open. And the next day I was back in my body again, but the following day I was back in his again. You said pointing at Bakugo again. Same goes for me too, he said lowly. Woke up in her body. Next day was back in mine, just continued to alternate like that. Wait, wait, Mitsuki muttered, pressing her fin fingers to her temples. So you two have been swapping bodies and living each other's lives? You both nodded. So that time that I was at the bathroom door and you walked out and screamed when I was standing right there was you? She looked from back ago to you. Ah, uh, yeah, and you accused me of screaming like a girl, you said with a light chuckle. Mitsuki's jaw fell open. And all those times I refused spicy food, it's her too, Bakugo added. You nodded. Yeah, I'm not keen on spicy things, he said with an apologetic smile. I can't believe this, Mitsuki said incredulously. So what, your soulmates now? Damn right, woman, Bakugo quipped quickly with a proud smile. So when did you two find each other, she asked. You tried to condense the events between when you'd had your accident to now and explained everything as best you could. Mitsuki seemed to be coming around to this whole thing and mentioned a few times that it was adorable, to which you heard Bakugo growl audibly. So there you go, Bakugo grunted after you had explained everything. Happy now? Do I have a choice? She shot back at Bakugo. Like I give a damn who you end up with as long as you're happy. And plus, I feel like I know this lovely girl already. She winked at you. Wait, I didn't even get your name, she said embarrassed. Please forgive me. 
Yin, he replied happily. Yin Lin. Pleasure to meet you, Yin. I'm sorry you ended up with such a shithead as your soulmate, though, she said, sneering at Bakugo. Watch it, you old hag, he growled, shifting as if to get up. You quickly moved your hand from his knee to his chest and held him back gently. He obeyed. Mitsuki saw and raised an eyebrow with amusement. Yin, dear, why don't you and Bakugo head to the kitchen or upstairs so I can have a chat with Mitsuki? Your grandma suddenly. Yeah, actually, I want to see if you still remember my room, Bakugo said sharply, getting up from his seat and pulling you up by the hand. You excused yourself and thanked Mitsuki for having you and your grandma over and then followed Bakugo through the door. Actually, you lead, he said, stopping and waiting for you to walk past him. You pointed out different things as you walked through his house and made straight for his room. He smiled coyly at your memory. Looks like you do remember my house, he said mischievously. You walked into his room and saw the burn marks still on the wall where you had detonated his quirk for the first time and didn't know how to control it. You laughed. It's still there, you said, pointing to the charred wall. Yeah, what the frick happened? He asked, stopping dangerously close behind you and taking a hold of your hip slightly. You inhaled sharply at his proximity and your focus wavered. Uh, I, um, you pointed to your hand. This. He bent his head down and let his lips trace along the back of your neck, running from where your neck joins your shoulder up to your hairline. You froze. Your heart started beating wildly and your mouth went dry as a tingly sensation shot through your core. Wow, his touch has an amazing command of my body, you thought. His hand slid slowly up your sides as he kissed you lightly on the back of the neck again, opening his mouth slightly to take a small amount of skin between his teeth and tugging on it gently. You stifled a moan. Where the heck did that come from? You thought. Your body seemed to be responding on its own and you turned around to face your man, his brilliant red eyes locking onto yours and he growled lowly as his hand snaked behind your back and pulled you into him. You could feel his heart thumping in his chest as he held you against him, his breath coming in short bursts against your cheek. I need you, he whispered carnally as he stared at you with a ferocious longing. Whoa, back who got Katsuki. Call me Katsuki, he said, reaching down and picking you up under your thighs and hoisting your legs up so that they could wrap around his torso. You squealed in surprise at his swift manoeuvre and marvelled at his strength as you wrapped your arms around his neck, pulling his head into your chest. He buried his face into your cleavage and inhaled deeply. You giggled. Baku, I mean, sorry, Katsuki, are you okay? You asked him, fondly tussling his hair with one hand as you smiled down at him. No, he said sharply. Your face fell. What's wrong? You asked as he marched to his bed and plopped you down, maintaining his position as he hovered over you. I... He looked away and clenched his jaw. I feel like I want you more than you want me. You tilted your head curiously. Well, yeah, it does kind of feel that way, doesn't it? I can't get you off my mind, he said directly, still averting his eyes. You're all I think about. I just want to touch you, hold you, but I feel like I'm always the one making the moves and it's frustrating. He hung his head and buried it into your neck. Well, Katsuki, to be honest, I've only really just got my memory back, so although I do remember everything about us, I still feel a little distant, you said, running your fingers through his hair as he relaxed his body on top of yours, one of his legs between yours. He lay quietly on top of you as you continued to caress his hair, letting your other hand trace down his back to his backside and back up again. I don't even know your favourite colour, you said suddenly. Orange, he mumbled into your neck. It's orange. You hummed in acknowledgement and then let silence fall once again. Now you ask me my favourite colour, he said softly. Ugh, he grunted, lifting his head to look into your eyes again. I'm not good with all this fluffy stuff. What's your favourite colour? It's red, you smirked. He grinned mischievously. Oh, so you are attracted to me then, he leered. You giggled. Katsuki, I'm definitely attracted to you, no doubt about that, but I feel like we need to get to know each other on a different level than what we know now. How much more do we need to know about each other, he said in exasperation. I've had your goddamn period for you, isn't that close enough? You let out a belly laugh. Oh god, the message you left me when you had been in my body and you got my period for the first time. You roared laughing again. It was hilarious. No, it wasn't hilarious, he growled. I got it at school and accused the guy who sits behind you in class of putting paint on the seat. 
I haven't punched him in the face. You cackled again. Okay, well, yeah, I know we're close like that, but we haven't even gone on a proper date yet, or had a deep and meaningful chat, or even talked about things that we like and dislike. Yeah, I know the basics about you, but only enough to get by on a day-to-day -day basis, you said. Bakugo scowled. Not much for the romantic stuff, he said, staring deeply into your eyes. Well, that much is obvious, he said with a playful smile. But if you really do like me, you'd be interested in knowing everything you can about me, right? He rolled his eyes. Yeah, I guess. Hey, look, you don't have to. I'm just giving you ideas on how to make me feel closer to you so that the relationship feels more level, you said, bopping him on the nose with a finger. So you'll start initiating more then? He asked with a coy smile. Well, I think that can be arranged, you said in a provocative tone, pushing him off and running to his wardrobe to grab one of his hoodies that had become your favourite. You pulled it on and spun around to face him, flicking the hoodie up over your head and adopting his usual scowl. He watched you with amusement as he lounged back on the bed with one arm propping his head up. Oi, you growled in your best Bakugo voice. Why the hell are you just lying there looking at me? Sit up when I'm talking to you. He sneered and sat up, spreading his legs a little as he slid to the side of the bed and rested back on his arms. That's better, you snarled, shoving your hands in, the po in your pockets and marching over to him. Oh, I think I like this version of Yin, he said suggestively as you grabbed him sharply on the chin and forced his face up so that he was looking at you as you placed one knee between his legs on the bed and leaned over him. Is this initiative enough for you, you damn extra? You growled lowly, narrowing your eyes at him. He smirked at you. You're acting like you're in charge, but really you ain't, he growled playfully. You sure about that? You snarled, still in character. It just makes it more fun for when I turn the tables and take control, he said back in a very low and provocative tone. You slid your hand from his chin to his jaw, then round to the base of his neck where you, where you dug your nails in slightly. You gripped onto his neck and forced a low groan of excitement from him as his crimson eyes lit up with desire. You leaned your head down, took his bottom lip between your teeth and tugged on it lightly while maintaining a very strong erotic eye contact. He groaned again and tried to reach up to take your face in his hands, but you swatted his hands away and pinned them to his side. Don't move, you commanded, releasing his lip and licking it lightly with your tongue. Your provocative actions broke him and he snapped, grabbing you and throwing you down on the bed. You squealed and laughed, falling out of character as he mounted you. You can't do that to me and not expect a reaction, he growled, kissing you down your neck and onto your collarbone, tugging his hoodie that you had on still out of the way to find that soft, delicate spot at the base of your neck so he could suck on it. He found it and latched on, his soft, hot tongue swirling around as he sucked. Your body gave in to him and you let out a soft moan as he pinned you under him. Whoa, he said, pulling away and smirking. Never heard that noise come from you before. Let's see if I can get you to make it again. He dropped his head back down to you and continued to bite and suck along your collarbone. Little mules of satisfaction escaped your lips, spurring him on. He groped you firmly through your top and you giggled a little. You're honestly not going to find anything there to grab, you chided playfully. Don't care, more of an ass man anyway, he mumbled back, not stopping what he was doing. And you have a fine ass. You giggled and wrapped your arms around his neck. He came back up to your face and kissed you fervently, deepening the kiss instantly and needily. You relaxed into him, your body heating up as the kisses got hungrier and sloppier. He pushed his leg between yours and you pushed your hips up into his, much to his delight. There was a lot of tension and heat gathering between your thighs, and the pressure from his leg there was a welcome relief. You ground into him to release the sensation, releasing the steam from the soft hoodie on him. You'd better stop that, he growled. I can't keep my hands off you, so I can't promise I won't hold back if you keep teasing me like that. You chuckled into the kiss and pulled off him. Oi! Where do you think you're going? He asked, aggressively pulling you back on top of him. Hey, you squeaked. Whoa, hold up. Bakugo's mind had well and truly fallen into the gutter and he was on a one-track road to living out his fantasies. He rolled on top of you again, pinning you underneath, his hips grinding against yours. You need to calm down, Kadsky, you pleaded with a giggle. Don't wanna, he mumbled back, kissing you roughly down your neck. It did feel good, but he seemed to be on a whole other level now. I'll help, you said with sudden seductiveness, 
His eyes shot up and met yours. You what? Help, you breathed, pulling up a pulling up to a seated position and kissing his shocked face. Naked grandma, he whispered in his ear. What? he said in surprise. I'm helping you to calm down, you lid. Saggy boobs, flab, your mum and dad doing it. Okay, stop, he yelled. It's working, damn. You giggled and kissed his forehead. Thank you for that, though, he said sweetly. I would like to return the favour, but not right now. I'm still a bit nervous. His red eyes scanned your face, and he leaned in slowly and kissed you softly, his surprisingly gentle kiss startling you a little. Had he ever been that tender before? You didn't think so. You don't owe me, he said lowly. I wanted to be close to you, and I liked that I could make you... His voice trailed off and he smirked cheekily. You smacked your hands to your face. I'm so embarrassed, you squealed. Don't be, he said. It was the hottest thing I've ever seen. I know I'm not good with expressing my feelings, but you need to know how much I like you. He dropped his head and you ruffled his hair. You've really got me in. There's nothing I wouldn't do for you, he said quietly. The surprised look on your face went unseen by him. Why though, Katsuki? you asked. I really don't understand why you like me so much. I don't understand it either, he said frankly. All I know is I'm crazy about you. Your heart skipped a beat as his eyes met yours. Those eyes kill me, he whispered, caressing his face. He smirked. Good. Let's hope it stays that way forever, he said, leaning in and kissing you tenderly again. You sighed happily and wrapped your arms around him, pulling him down on top of you. You lay in each other's arms for a while, just enjoying the silence and company. I feel a lot closer to you now, he mumbled, as he turned his face to bury it into his hoodie that you were still wearing. I want you to keep this hoodie too, so that people know that you're mine, and mine only. His voice dropped into a low, husky, commanding register. You loved his protectiveness. He was a man in every sense of the word, and you loved feeling being the girl of such a strong and powerful guy. He had this commanding presence, except when he was with you, of course. You, and you alone, could soften him. You gave him one last squeeze and then made a move to get out from under him. We should head back downstairs to your mum and my grandma, he said. They'll be wondering what happened to us. He groaned but followed your lead, following you out of his room, but not without one last slap to your backside and a good grab of your cheek. Mmm, he grunted. His ass is mine. You giggled and playfully swatted his hand away. Behave! you demanded, holding your index finger up in warning. He tried to bite your finger and you tapped his nose with it, and so he growled softly as you turned and skipped down the hall. Oh, it's you, Yin! I thought you were Bakugo in that hoodie, Mitsuki said as you rounded the corner to the kitchen. I am Bakugo, you replied, copying his actions and shoving your hands in the pockets of the hoodie. You made a form a few more Bakugo-esque comments that made Mitsuki laugh. Yin, dear, your language is foul. Your grandma interjected, mortified. Oh, I'm sorry, grandma, you cried, slapping a hand to your mouth. I was imitating him. You pointed to Bakugo, who was leaning up against the doorway frame, watching you with amusement. She got it pretty close, too, he said with a proud smirk. Your grandma sighed heavily. Oh, what do I do with you two? There was an amused gleam in her eye, so you knew she wasn't completely angry with you or him. You all chatted a little longer before your grandma started to wrap things up to head home. Well, Mitsuki dear, thank you very much for having us, she said, standing up. Oh, love, you are welcome here any time, Mitsuki replied happily. Both of you, please drop by any time. You smiled at Bakugo, who winked at you. I'll walk him home, he said, looking over to his mum. She nodded and walked to the front door with you all. Oh, and love, she said, addressing your grandma. Let me know when to put the uh, operation into action, she said with a wink. Operation? What operation? you asked. What operation is this, Grandma? you asked her on the way home. She chuckled as she walked. You'll see, she replied in a sing-song voice. Bakugo reached out and took your hand in his, and you looked over at him in surprise. What? he asked gruffly. Oh, nothing, it's just you're holding my hand voluntarily. You said with a little cheeky smile. Because I want to, he muttered as he shoved his other hand in his pocket. You squeezed his hand gently and gave him a big grin. Don't let go, I like it, you whispered across to him. He said, looking away to hide the small blush across his cheeks. 
He walked you and your grandma home and gave you a quick peck on the lips before turning and heading for home. You go on in, Grandma. I'm just going to say a proper goodbye to Katsuki. Katsuki? She replied in surprise, an eyebrow raised. Um, yeah, he asked me to call him by his first name tonight, you said, shyly avoiding eye contact and fiddling with your fingers. Your grandma grinned. I'm glad to hear it. Your eyes met hers and you gave her a relieved smile. Go, dear. I'll make an excuse for you, your grandma said with a wink. Don't be too long, though, she called as you raced out the gate. Bakugo had already disappeared around the corner and you sprinted to catch up to him before he got too far away. You rounded the bend and saw him in the distance. Katsuki! You called as you started to run again. He spun around the minute that he heard your voice. In! He called, his eyes wide, worried that something had happened. He started back towards you but noticed the big grin on your face as you got closer to him and realised you were okay. You were still running fast and he could tell that you didn't plan on slowing anytime soon, so he dropped into a slight squat and held his arms out, indicating to you to just run and jump into them. You understood his non-verbal cues and leapt at him, and he grabbed you into a bear hug and spun you around to wash some of the speed off that you'd collected. What's up, baby? He said lowly, your heart skipping a beat at his use of the word. He certainly didn't strike you as the type to use pet names, but his deeply rich voice made it sound that much sweeter. I just wanted to give you a proper kiss goodbye, he said between huffs. He smirked and kissed your forehead. Well then give me a proper kiss goodbye, he said in a provocative tone. He still had you wrapped in his arms and he waited for you to make the first move, placing you gently back down on the ground. You stretched up and kissed him smack on the lips, parting yours ever so slightly to invite him to deepen the kiss if he wanted to, which he did, and he took the invitation instantly. You let your hands roam his body, gliding your fingers down his insanely cut abs. You could feel them easily through his shirt and you felt him smirk into the kiss, letting out a little chuckle of acknowledgement. You like those, don't you? He said, kissing you again. Mm-hmm, you mumbled in agreement your fingers finding the base of his shirt and sliding underneath. He shuddered as your soft fingers caressed his warm flesh and you ran your hand around his back and slid them up to his shoulders and dragged them tantalizingly slowly down his back, letting your nails scratch him ever so gently. He moaned. Ugh, yen the way you drag your fingers down my back like that. You were starting to make him lose his control again for the second time that night. You kissed him one last time then pulled away. I better get going now, you said cheekily. Oh, no, you don't, he growled playfully, grabbing your wrists and pulling you back into him again. You squealed and giggled as he kissed and bit you lightly down your neck. Katsuki, you squeaked. I really do need to go, but I'll see you soon, okay? He growled against your skin, as if he were a beast denied his prey. Okay, fine, he said reluctantly. Let's go on a date soon. What? You said, shocked. A date? Did I stutter? He grunted, averting his eyes and scratching his cheek. You smiled and kissed him on the cheek. Okay, you said cheerily. Text me, he added as you backed away, blowing him a kiss. He grunted again, his crimson eyes watching you go. He watched you as you backed away all the way to the corner. She'll be the death of me, he shook his head. She's going to kill me when she takes that hoodie off and sees the hickey I left on her collarbone. He smirked to himself. I just want to make her mine. I need her to know that she's mine and I, I love her. You skipped back home on a high and let yourself inside. No one questioned your whereabouts and you made your way to your room to prepare for a shower. As you took the hoodie off, you saw a purple bruise starting to show on your skin just above your collarbone. You looked at it, confused, and touched it lightly with your fingers. What on earth happened here, you thought, thumbing it gently. It didn't hurt. Where did it come from? Suddenly you remembered that Bakugo had been paying a lot of attention to this area earlier in the night and you blushed as sudden realisation set in. Is this a hickey? You grabbed for your phone and texted Bakugo. Katsuki, my neck! You tapped out in capitals and sent it to him. He sent back a devilish smiling emoji, emoji and the words, just so they know you're mine. Who? My family? You thought as you sent a line of crying face emojis back. The next day, Bakugo called you. Hey, he said briskly. Hey, you replied with a giant smile that he couldn't see through the phone but could definitely hear from the happiness in your voice. Want to go on that date that this weekend? He asked lowly. He sounded like he was a little embarrassed actually about asking you on a date. 
Is this the first time he's ever asked someone on a date before? You thought. Sure, he replied cheerfully. Okay, good. Where, uh, where's something nice? I'm taking you out somewhere special. You ooed into the phone and got a sharp curse in reply. He was trying, bless him. He wasn't used to being mushy, but you were so precious to him that he wanted to do anything and everything right to please you. He made some quick time additions and the place to meet and then said a hurried goodbye and hung up. You smiled down at your phone. You knew it was just his awkward shyness that was making him like this. You happily slipped your phone in your pocket and skipped to the kitchen where your family was making afternoon snacks. You greeted them all warmly and grabbed yourself some biscuits and then sat at the table to chat and eat. We should go out for dinner tonight, your grandma said randomly from her seat at the end of the table. Everyone stopped what they were doing and just looked at her. That sounds good, your mum said with a smile. Any reason to not have to cook is good enough for me. Everyone else agreed and grandma suggested the sushi train place just down the road. It was set. You were excited to be going out. 6pm rolled around and everyone was almost ready to leave. You picked up Bakugo's hoodie, just for comfort's sake and then waited with everyone at the door, then followed them out, making small talk as you all walked to the shop. Once inside, Grandma insisted that everyone sit along the table facing the trays of the sushi going past. No one complained, so you just took orders and sat down on the high stool bars. Your grandma seemed quite intent on seating positions and put your mum and dad closest to the door, where there were more empty seats next to them. You thought nothing of it. A few more minutes rolled by and you were picking the sushi dishes off the conveyor belt when the door to the shop tinkled open and you looked up to see who had entered. Your mouth fell open. It was Mitsuki and Masaru, Bakugo's parents. Mitsuki saw the look on your face and winked, making her way over to your parents and acting as if she had just come to eat. She asked if she could sit next to them and your mother obliged and then they made small talk while Mitsuki picked out some dishes to eat. You were still staring, dumbfound, when your grandma nudged you. Stop staring, dear, let them be, she whispered, continuing to pick dishes off the conveyor, unfazed. You looked back down at your food and whispered quietly back to her. Is this the operation that you and Mitsuki were talking about? She nodded slightly with a devilish smile. And it's working perfectly, she chuckled. You looked back down the line and saw both his and your parents were having quite a good chat by now. Where's Katsuki? you asked Grandma, returning your gaze to her. He's coming later, she replied softly. He's coming? you hissed in a low tone. Yes, dear, don't worry, it's all going to work out well. She gave you a wink as she reached for the soy sauce. You hummed an unsure noise and went back to your food. Suddenly your phone vibrated in your pocket and you pulled it out. Oi, what the heck is going on? the new message from Katsuki said. Are you here? You sent back, glancing at the door and seeing a shadow move behind a pillar. Yeah, out front. Why are you guys here? Grandma, you sent back. She set this up. Your mum is in on it too. It's that operation thing that they were talking about at your place. <laughs> Wingma, came his reply. I won't come in yet. I'm early anyway. I'll wait outside. Okay, you sent back, exiting the chat and sliding your phone into your pocket. The butterflies had taken over your stomach now and you couldn't eat any more so you just pushed the food around your plate, praying everything would work out okay. Yin, your mum called suddenly from down the line. You jumped violently. Yes, you yelped back. Your mum looked at you strangely for a second. Uh, this is Mitsuki and Masaru, she said, gesturing, gesturing to them. Hello, you replied politely, trying not to let your nerves show in your smile. They have a boy about your age and they live close to here, your mum added, doing her best to play matchmaker. She's going to die when she finds out, you thought. Suddenly you heard the squealing of tyres and an explosion, followed by profanities untamed. You looked up just as a car came crashing through the side of the shop. Another explosion shot from the front door and you jumped off your seat before being knocked to the ground. The car had ploughed head on into the sushi train restaurant and had knocked you all flying. You hit the ground and tried to pick yourself up, but the counter had collapsed onto your legs, pinning you to the ground. You let out a fearful cry and looked around wildly. All of your family and Bakugo's parents had been trapped under the counter, and you cried out when you saw the car had come to a stop over your parents. Your dad was bleeding badly from the head, and your mum was unconscious. Suddenly, a familiar voice was above you. Don't move, babe, I got you. You looked up. It was Katsuki, and he was mad. Damn. 
he muttered when he realised he couldn't just lift the counter off your legs as there was a whole damn car resting on top of it. My parents, you cried out to him. Please help them. Your eyes welled up as your gaze fell to your unconscious mother. But you, I don't care about me. Please, Katsuki, you cried out in anguish again. If I'd only been paying more attention, I'd have been able to hit that car and stop it, he growled furiously at no one in particular. I'm going to kill him, he seethed. He paced up and down the line of you all stuck under the rubble and muttered curse words as he determined what to do, his eyes constantly darting back to you as you were his main concern. Even though you could tell he was rattled, he remained calm and collected. He pulled his shirt off over his head and roughly folded it to make a makeshift bandage for your father's head and applied it gently but firmly. Don't move, he commanded your dad. I'll get you out. Thank you, your dad mumbled, not realising who he was talking to. Bakugo looked over at his parents. They were trapped too, but no heavy wounds from what he could see. Oi, you okay? He asked his parents roughly. They nodded in response. He pulled his phone out of his back pocket and handed it to his mum. Call for police and an ambulance. I need to administer first aid to the others, he said in a low, commanding tone. His mum obeyed and dialed emergency services, detailing where they were and what had happened. Bakugo came back over to you and took your face in his hands. I'm here, I'm still here, don't worry he said, forcing you to look him deeply in the eye. You nodded quietly. You didn't realise how scared you were, but he could see it in your eyes and was doing his best to comfort you. He leaned in and kissed you firmly on the lips, getting you out. He stood up and walked in beside you, grabbing the countertop in both hands, his back muscles rippling as he heaved, using all his strength to make it move, but he only managed to shift it slightly. Damn! He shouted in frustration looking for a lower place to grip onto so he could get more leverage. Ambulance is on its way, Mitski called from where she was still pinned underneath. We'd better hurry up, he growled, still trying to lift the counter off you and the others. Your grandma groaned from beside you and you realised that, that was the first nice noise that you'd heard from her. Grandma, you asked softly, reaching out a hand to her. Are you okay? I'd like to say I am, dear, but I don't think I am, she said raising her head weakly and looking at you. She looked very pale. Katsuki, you called to Bakugo, who was still trying to lift the countertop. Grandma's hurt, badly, I think, you said, distress evident in your voice. Bakugo turned and looked at you, then at Grandma. Hold on, he grunted, just hold on. He was getting more and more frustrated until finally he couldn't take it anymore and stood back slightly before activating his quirk and blasting the countertop off. You screamed and covered your head, and then you felt a hand in the middle of your back, steadying you. It's okay, you heard Bakugo say. I've almost got it. He had blasted enough off to be able to lift the rubble and move you out from underneath. He dragged you into his arms and held you against his heaving chest. He was slightly sweaty from exertion and fear, but he smelled amazing, like burnt caramel. You dug your fingers into his back and neck and clung on for dear life, whimpering softly at the pain that you felt in your legs. I've got you, baby, he whispered lowly, pulling you to a safe distance away. Will you be okay here while I get the others out? You nodded slowly. You didn't want him to go, but you knew that you needed to let him go to let get the others out, so you reluctantly let go. Next, you went to your grandma and pulled her out. Her legs were crushed badly and she was bleeding profusely. You reached for a tablecloth and pulled yourself over to her. You couldn't feel your legs, but they weren't crushed. You were hoping the feeling would come back in time. You bandaged your grandma's legs as best you could and watched as Bakugo worked at getting your mum and dad free. He was a mass of grunting and cursing, but he managed to get your mum free and pulled her still unconscious form over to you. He was well and truly covered in sweat now and glistening as he worked. You knew it wasn't the best time to be checking out your boyfriend's body, but damn the boy looked good. You were so proud of him in every way possible at that moment. He was so good at reading dire situations, and although he sounded angry as hell, he kept a collected and calm demeanour. Surprisingly, everyone in his care looked calm as well. He seemed to be getting stronger as he worked, and got everyone free of the rubble just as emergency services arrived. Bakugo came back to you the minute that they took over, and pulled you into his arms, refusing to let you go. The paramedics looked over everybody and decided who needed the most attention. When they declared that you were the one of the less injured ones and thus didn't need immediate attention, Bakugo lost his cool. Listen, you extras. You'll take care of her first. She's the only damn person in this room that matters, he growled menacingly. You placed a hand on his arm and kissed his cheek softly. I'm fine, Katsuki, I promise. At hearing your voice, he calmed down and just glared at the emergency crew. 
Your mother, father and grandma were all taken to the hospital in a serious condition with your two sisters and yourself being treated for minor wounds. You still couldn't feel your legs very well and the medical team requested that you come to the hospital for an MRI scan to make sure that everything was okay with your bones and nerves. Mitski offered to drive you to the hospital and Katsuki insisted on coming as well, of course. It was a good thing that you'd brought Bakugo's hoodie with you as he now didn't have a clean shirt on so he just pulled the hoodie on over his sweaty chiseled body. Masaru took your sisters back to the Bakugo residence and looked after them until you, Mitsuki and Katsuki arrived from the hospital. All the scans for your back came back clear and they cautioned you that it would maybe take a day or two for you to regain full feeling and function of your legs. You were told to come back if it took longer than a week. You made a quick visit to your parents and grandma in their hospital rooms and told them you and your sisters would be staying at the back of Go's house. By now, they'd found out that your soulmate, Katsuki, was the son of Mitsuki and Masaru, and as you suspected, they were a little shell-shocked, which didn't help the situation. They didn't really have a lot to say about it at the time, though, as there were far more pressing matters to be concerned with, so they approved it on the spot. Your mum had woken as the paramedics were loading her into the ambulance and she seemed to be okay. She remembered everything and had good speech so the emergency crew weren't concerned about her well-being. Well, they weren't worried about her having any brain damage at least. How are you sis? Your baby sister Mika asked as you entered the house. She was worried that you couldn't walk properly yet. I'm going to be okay, you said, smiling down at her from Katsuki's arms. He had insisted on carrying you everywhere and would sneak a kiss on your head or lips whenever he got the chance. He was stoked that you'd be staying at his house for the next few weeks and was glad to have you close so that he could keep an eye on your progress, but he'd never tell you that unless absolutely necessary. He had his pride to keep intact. You'll stay in my room. I'll sleep in the lounge, Bakugo said gruffly as he placed you gently down on his bed. Your sisters will stay in the spare room. You kept your arms wrapped around his neck as he placed you down and refused to let go. Can, can I have a hug for a little longer? You whispered sadly, burying your face into his chest. Baby, he whispered lowly back to you. Are you okay? You could feel yourself breaking. You hadn't really shed a tear during that whole ordeal and all your pent up emotions were coming to the surface. Your man, asking if you were okay in such a deep and caring tone, brought your walls tumbling down and hot tears fluttered down your cheeks. You clung to him and sobbed heavily. He seemed to understand that it was just a byproduct of the incident and just held you without saying a word, just letting you cry it out. As you started to calm down, he spoke. I saw the car. It was out of control, he mumbled, his head bending over yours. I was headed for the sushi place. I shot an explosion at the car to try and divert its course, his voice trailed off. He clutched you desperately. I thought I was going to lose you, he whispered, his body starting to shake. You pulled back and looked at him in surprise. He was acting a lot more vulnerable than you'd ever seen him act before. He turned his face away from yours and you heard him sniff. You reached a hand up and touched his cheek. It was wet. You forced his face to look at you and he allowed you to move his head, but he squeezed his eyes shut so you couldn't look him in the eye. He had tears rolling down his cheeks. Your heart broke. You'd never seen Bakugo cry before. You'd seen him slightly vulnerable before, but that was about it. You kissed his tear-stained face and wiped them dry with your hands. Bakugo and Katsuki, I, I love you, he whispered quietly, almost regretting the words the minute that they left your mouth. Would he reject you? His eyes shot open and he stared at you before bending his head and kissing you passionately. You pushed your parted lips back against his, your tongues dancing together, conveying all the unspoken emotions that were still looming overhead. He lay you backwards on the bed and crawled over you, pinning you under his body. He loved being on top of you, and you liked being under the body of such a masculine man. His kisses were passionate, but it didn't hold the same lust that it had at previous times. His kisses were different. His kiss was filled with love. As he pulled away from you, he nuzzled into the side of your neck and kissed you gently. I love you to you, he said quietly yet confidently. I have for a long time, and I always will. You hugged him close and enjoyed his warmth before he pulled off you and helped you lie down properly in his bed. Let me make sure everyone else is good. I'll be back to help you shower. Well, what? You said, startled. Help me shower? Yeah, he replied with a blank expression. You can't move properly, so how the hell are you going to be able to shower? Fair point, you replied with a thoughtful look on your face. But the thought of him being there when you had no clothes on was terrifying. 
You covered your face with embarrassment. He smirked and chuckled slightly. I'll be back, he said lowly, his tone of voice dripping with seduction. You squealed. You panicked a little more while Bakugo was helping everybody else for a bit and then jumped violently when he came back, pushing the door open widely. He took one look at your face and knew that you were still mortified about the thought of him seeing you naked. Would you relax? He said, half joking, half serious. If you're that shy about it, I'll close my eyes or you can blindfold me, he said, crossing his arms across his chest and tilting his head. No, no, I should be fine, you replied, trying to play it cool. He snorted and walked over, scooping you up in his arms with ease. Listen, we don't have any of your clothes here yet, so you can wear mine. You nodded shyly and curled into him. Yin, if you're really uncomfortable about me helping you in the shower, then just tell me, okay? I'll figure out a way to help you without actually being there, he said, that familiar softness creeping back into his voice. No, no, I do want you there, you replied shyly. I just don't know how to express what I'm feeling, maybe a little excited, but at the same time I'm nervous about you seeing my whole body naked. You buried your face into his hoodie again. How many times do I have to tell you, Yin, your body's perfect? I've seen you naked heaps of times when I was in your own body. Chill out, would you? It's like looking at my own body, except it's on you, and it turns me on. You squeaked with embarrassment and he chuckled. Cute. Okay, let's go. And with that, he spun around and marched out of the room and down the hall to the shower. Once inside, he sat you down on the bathroom bench and shut the door. Your heart was pounding in your chest as he walked back over to you and placed a hand either side of you on the counter and looked up into your eyes. You smiled weakly, glad that you were sitting. You wouldn't have been able to hold your weight up otherwise, even if your legs were in good use. His eyes had melted you from the inside out. You ready? He asked slowly. You giggled nervously and nodded shyly. You sure? He asked again, studying you with those crimson eyes. Because if you're not, I'm not doing anything. You took a deep breath and responded with the most confident, yes, you could muster. He smiled and kissed you quickly on the lips. Do you need help with your shirt? He asked, stepping back. Ah, uh, no, I got it, you said, holding onto the bottom of your top and toying with it a bit. I'll start the shower, he said abruptly turning his back to you and reaching into the stall to turn the hot water on. You get as much off as you can while I get this ready for you, he called over his shoulder. You obeyed and took your top and bra off, letting them both fall to the floor. Bakugo still had his back to you, so you unzipped your jeans and tried to slide them off. You got them halfway down, but couldn't kick them off, so decided to wait for him. Can I turn around now? he asked gently. Ah, uh, yeah, you replied, quickly covering your boobs with your hands. He turned slowly and looked at you, and then walked back over to you and captured your lips against his, giving you a reassuring kiss. You beautiful, Yin, he said as he helped tug your jeans off. Uh, so how's this going to work then, you asked. Are you just going to sit me down in the bottom of the shower and stay outside, or... Sudden invitation, he smirked. Could be, you shot back, a sudden spike in confidence giving you the power to reply so boldly. Whoa! <laughs> He said, amused at your suggestive reply. Well, might take you up on the offer then, he said, pulling his hoodie off over his head. You removed your hands from your boobs and ran your fingers over his chest, and he stared into your eyes as you touched him. He loved it when you caressed him like that. He reached down and unzipped his pants. Can I take them off? He asked in a deep voice. Go for it, he replied, suddenly no longer shy. He pulled his pants down and you could see that familiar bulge straining against the fabric of his boxes. He kicked the pants off and lifted you off the bench up against him. Let's go, he said as he held you against his body. He was so warm. Yep, you replied chirpily. He turned and carried you to the shower, stepping inside and under the flow of water, both of you still in your underwear. The hot water felt amazing against your back and he did a few rotations so that you both got thoroughly wet. His hair got slicked down and he looked like a completely different person without his usual spikes. He was still gorgeous though. Do you want to see if you can hold your weight on your legs? He asked. You nodded and he lowered you down so that your feet were on the ground. They were still quite numb but you found that you could at least hold your own body weight on them. This allowed Bakugo a free hand to help wash you. He got the body lotion and gently rubbed your back and shoulders with it, pulling you against himself and instructing you to wrap your arms around him so he could scrub you down. You did. He was surprisingly good at giving you a massage. You sighed into him and relaxed as he worked. Can, uh, 
can I take these off? He asked, tugging gently at your panties. Oh, okay, you said, but only if you take yours off too. He replied cheekily, looking up at him and winking. Sure about that, he sneered. There's a beast waiting to be unleashed in there. You laughed. Ah, think I can handle the beast, maybe even tame it. His eyes shot wide open in surprise. <laughs> Is that so? He growled with a sly smirk. And how about you show me how you can tame the beast? He added with a slight eyebrow raise, the spray from the shower dripping slowly down his face. Oh, it's easy, he said coyly, sliding a hand down his abs and over the large bulge in his soaking wet boxes. He bit his bottom lip in between his teeth as your palm came in contact with him, sliding your palm up and down him on the outside of his boxes. Take them off, he growled lowly as he craned his head down to kiss you, his lips pressing into the wet palm. That was the best shower I've ever had, he said with a devious chuckle, doing one last wash of you both before turning the water off and carrying you out of the stall. You were still coming down from your climax and well and truly sleepy. He dried you down and sat you on the bathroom bench so that he could dry himself and you did your best not to stare but oh those abs. He tied the towel around his waist and reached out to take you in his arms again. Wait wait you screeched. Katsuki I don't have a towel on. In his fervour of drying he forgot to wrap you in a towel and was about to march out the door carrying you butt naked down the hallway. Oh sorry he yelled grabbing a towel and wrapping it, you in it before picking you up and walking out the door. Mitsuki was in the hall and gave you a quizzical look when she saw the two of you freshly showered. Am I getting grandkids? She sneered in a whisper, just loud enough for the two of you to hear as she passed by. Screw you old hag, I ain't giving you anything, Bakugo hollered, causing you to jump violently at the sudden explosive volume. He kissed you quickly on the head as an apology when he felt you jump in his arms and carried you back to his room. He helped dress you in his clothes and you snuggled into the black shirt with the skull on it, inhaling his burnt caramel scent deeply. Your eyelids were heavy and you were yawning profusely so he tucked you in and gave you a quick kiss on the forehead before walking out and down to the lounge room. The next three weeks were wonderful for you. Because you still weren't attending school you made sure to help out around the house as much as possible, cooking and cleaning and making biscuits for Katsuki to eat when he got home from school. His go-to line was, these are delicious but not as delicious as you and he usually added the line with a devious cookie crumbed grin and a slap to your ass. You had regained the feeling in your legs after three days and felt like your usual self again. Some days Bakugo would come home later than usual and said that he'd stop in to see someone. You didn't think much about it until your parents started commenting on seeing him multiple times a day. Unbeknownst to you, Bakugo had been dropping in to see them at the hospital on occasion and keeping them up to date on how you and your sisters were going. Your parents and grandma were recovering well and they were starting to see underneath all that bravado that was your Katsuki. Although he had a short temper and a foul mouth, he was a sweetheart underneath it all and they were quietly happy that he was your soulmate. The time came for them to be discharged from hospital and you and your sisters made plans to move back home. Bakugo spent most of his time sulking. He didn't want you to go. He was enjoying having you around every day. From the late night snuggles on the lounge to the heated makeout sessions in his room, his life, so far, was complete. He begrudgingly helped you pack and kept his mouth shut as he worked. And you tried to start up a conversation a few times but mostly got a grunt in reply. Hey, what's wrong? You asked suddenly, unable to ignore the fact that he was being unusually grumpy. I don't want you to go, he pouted angrily, shoving a handful of your clothes into your duffel bag. Kadsky, he giggled, we're not breaking up. You teased with a tap on of his nose with your finger. He grabbed your hand and held you still, staring deeply into your eyes. I know that, he growled. I don't like that you're going to be so far away from me. You smiled and stepped into his arms, forcing him to wrap his arms around you. I'm always here, he said. We'll still see each other every day. You leaned up and kissed him on the lips. He grunted and leaned down, chasing your retreating lips so that he could kiss you again. I got an open day on this Thursday. Come? Of course I'll come, you replied with excitement. What are you going to be doing? Quirk displays, he replied shortly. Will you be in costume? You asked hopefully. You'd seen the drawings of what his costume was supposed to look like, but you'd never seen him in it. Yeah, he said with a smirk and a chuckle. Coming over perv. 
You pouted and smacked him lightly, lightly on the shoulder. I'm not a perv. Sure you're not, he leered, pulling his shirt up so that you could see his abs. You groaned with delight and traced over his curves with your fingers as he watched you with a delightedly sly grin. You can see this perfect specimen in action on Thursday, he said with a wink, pulling his shirt down. Okay, deal, you said with a cheeky smile, turning back to your packing. He seemed happier after that and helped you pack your things and carried it to the car. Thank you, Katsuki, he said gratefully as he hauled your things up into the house and back to your room. How long were you with us? A year? He grunted as he struggled with your bags. It's not that much, you sook, he giggled. He dropped your things in your bedroom doorway and pounced on you, tackling you onto the bed. You squealed and giggled. I love you, you said, looking up at him as he hovered over you, pinning you to the bed. I love you too, he mumbled back, leaning in to give you a kiss. You felt lonely that night and sent him a message. He replied straight away. You bored too? You asked. I miss you, he replied with. Oh, the great Bakugo Katsuki misses someone? You teased. Shut up, he responded with. You sent him a wink emoji and he responded with the eggplant emoji. You rolled your eyes and laughed. Sky never changes. He doesn't miss me, he misses getting some. You knew that wasn't true, but Bakugo certainly did like physical affection. See you Thursday, you replied, and rolled over to go to sleep. Thursday finally came, and you couldn't wait to get to UA. You knew how to get there, you'd memorised it from your house. You also remembered the layout of the school once inside the grounds, and quickly made your way to Class 1A. You poked your head through the door, and saw Bakugo leaning back casually in his chair, talking with Karishma and Kaminari. Kaminari was the first to spot you, and nudged Bakugo, who, upon seeing you, dropped his chair down and jumped up, smirking as he walked towards you. My girl's here, he said in his low, sexy voice, reaching out and wrapping an arm around you when, you got to, when he got to you. You giggled as his lips met yours. He kissed you like he was claiming you, and then broke away from the kiss, turning to face the remaining classmates who were watching on. Listen up, you extras. This is my girlfriend, Yin. She's mine, and mine only. She's my soulmate, and she's better than all of you combined. You blushed heavily and hissed at Bakugo. Katsuki, you can't say that. You were flattered but extremely embarrassed at the same time. I can say whatever I want when it comes to being proud of you, he sneered, pulling you close to his side with one arm. Oh, is that Bakugo's quirkless girlfriend I see? A particularly loud and obnoxious voice rang out from the back door of the classroom. Your eyes shot over to see who it was. Monoma. Bakugo growled as he let go of you and started storming towards the boy who was peering at him from the doorway. The man who thinks himself better than the rest has a quirkless girlfriend. How amusing! The haughty voice rang out again. I'll kill you, you bastard. Bakugo snarled as he detonated small explosions in the palms of his hands, getting close enough to the boy called Monoma to throw a ball of explosives at him. But just before he got there, a giant fist came barreling through the door and sent Monoma flying. Bakugo stopped short and waited for the owner of the fist to present themselves. God, why? Honestly, all I ever do in life is chase this moron around and keep him out of trouble. Sorry, Bakugo. A sprightly red head grumbled as she stepped through the back door of the classroom and walked over to where she had knocked Monoma into the opposite wall. She grabbed a hold of his collar and picked the top half of his torso up by it and then marched out of the classroom, dragging him behind her. Damn extras, always getting in my way. Just when I was about to blast that coffee cap bastard, Bakugo growled angrily, clenching and unclenching his fists. I'm gonna blast him the next time I see him. Katsuki, it's fine, honestly, you said, walking up beside him. I don't care that I'm quirkless. You looked up at him with a smile. He looked down at you and grunted. I don't care either, but it's just the way he said it, he said, still seething that he didn't get to blast Monoma. Okay, everyone get ready for the quirk display, Aizawa said from the front door of the classroom. Scouts, don't wait for anyone. You followed the rest of 1A class to the viewing stands and sat down with Karishima and Kaminari at their request. Bakugo was one of the first up for the display, so he had to send head to the change rooms to get his costume on. You've seen him in his costume before, yeah? You asked Karishima. Oh yeah, he replied with a big toothy smile. Plenty times. He looks so manly, he gushed. Kaminari snorted. He's got the same cup size as Hero Midnight, he said, leaning back in his chair and smirking as he crossed his arms. You're just jealous that he has a flawless physique and you don't, Karishima retorted. 
obviously protective of his best friend. Yu chuckled lightly at the banter and sat back, waiting for Bakugo to appear. Finally, the doors to the arena opened and Bakugo, Midoriya and Todoroki appeared. He looked Todoroki and Midoriya's costumes over and nodded slightly. They weren't bad costumes, but they weren't amazing either. Quite simple, really. Then your eyes settled on your man and you inhaled sharply. His outfit was indeed striking. He had a black mask on that had jagged edges and a black and orange explosive mantle that sprung up from behind his head. His outfit itself was simple in design, yet extremely flattering in its fit to his body. His shoulders and parts of his chest were exposed and you could see his muscles ripple when he walked. He had two giant gauntlets on his forearms, which you knew, knew were an important feature, but couldn't help but think that they might have been a little too heavy. Well, you'd see in a moment though, when he displayed his power. You couldn't help but admire him and leaned forward in your chair, subconsciously showing your interest. He looked up into the stands and saw you watching him intently and smirked and winked at you as he sauntered by and you reflexively bit your bottom lip. Damn, he looks good, you thought. You watched Todoroki go first and noted his control when expelling his ice. He had good form and moved effortlessly. The quirk display was catered to each hero and their abilities and thus he had a routine set up that best showed off his ice and fire skill. Your man was next and three human cutout targets were set up. The bell rang and Bakugo crouched slightly before screaming die at the top of his lungs and then throwing his arms back behind himself to use his explosion quirk as a propellant. He shot himself at the first target and using his explosions again maneuvered midair to blast the cutout at three different levels. He landed in a hero pose and stood before lunging at the next target and obliterating it. You duly noted that he wielded his gauntlets effortlessly and was more than strong enough to carry them. He successfully destroyed all three targets in an overly impressive display of power and at the end casually walked out of the arena, leaving everyone in the stands dumbfound. I don't think I've ever heard that many curse words and declarations of death used in one setting ever, one of the officials nearby commented. You grinned to yourself, that's my man. Excusing yourself from the stands, you made your way back down to the boys change room hoping to catch Katsuki in costume before he went into change. You sprinted down the stairs and jumped from the second one down, landing lightly before tearing off again down the corridor. You slowed as you got to the change room doors and noted that no one else was around. Muttering disappointedly, you turned to go back to the stands when the boys' door opened. You spun back around and was about to make an apology to whoever was about to come out when you saw the one and only Bakugo standing there in the doorway, a giant smirk on his face. Looking for someone? He said with casual suggestiveness, leaning up against the door frame with his forearm. Ah, oh, no one's special, you said flippantly, waving your hand dismissively as you strolled back towards him, a sly smile on your face. He had started to change when he heard you come up to the boys' change room door and instinctively knew it was you, so walked to the door, half undressed, to see you. He was shirtless and gauntletless, but still had the black pants and black and orange boots on with the eye mask. You walked up to him and pressed your hands against his chest as you looked lovingly into his eyes. He maintained his stance against the door and leered down at you. Aren't you going to hug me? You pried, pouting slightly. Oh, but I thought you weren't looking for anyone special, so... His voice trailed off as he looked away from you, glancing slightly back at you from the corner of his eye to see your reaction. Oh, well... What I meant was, you trailed your fingers down his torso to the top line of his belt and tugged on it slightly. Why well, you want to do that here, do you? He sneered, pulling you into himself and backing into the boys' change room. Katsuki, he gasped. I'm not allowed in here. You squealed as he dragged you backwards to his locker and he turned you around and pinned you against it. I don't care what's allowed and what's not allowed, he said lowly, leaning down and kissing you roughly down your neck. You gave in to him and turned your head slightly to give him better access, sighing gently. You felt his lips smirk against your neck. Good girl, he breathed as he kissed and nipped you gently once again. You ran your fingers up his sides, feeling his obliques and lats as you worked your way up. You could feel him shuddering with excitement under your touch and you smiled cheekily. Uh, sh should, should I come another time? A voice said from the door. You looked over Bakugo's arm and saw Karishima standing nervously in the doorway. The poor boy was extremely embarrassed at having caught you two in the middle of a makeout session and was blushing madly and averting his eyes while fiddling with his fingers. 
right now, shitty hair. You had to come in right now. I'm sorry, Baku Bro. I, I can go if you... Krishma, it's okay. I was just leaving, he said sweetly, trying to make Krishma feel better. Bakugo growled as he slid out from his clutches and made your way to the door. I'll uh, see you in the stand soon, okay, babe? You said quickly to the seething Bakugo before running off down the hall. Bakugo shot daggers at Krishma, who apologised profusely again. You really like her, don't you, bro? Kiri commented as he changed into his costume, readying himself for his turn at the quirk display. Of course, Bakugo grunted. There was a moment's silence before Bakugo spoke again. I'm going to give her a promise ring. I've already bought it, he added gruffly, pulling the black mask off and chucking it into the locker. Whoa, seriously? That's awesome, bro. Super manly, which I always expected from you, Krishma gushed. When are you going to give it to her? He asked, his eyes sparkling with excitement. Gonna go on out on a date this weekend. Give it to her then, Bakugo replied, shoving his hands in his pockets. If you say anything, I'll kill you, he mumbled, averting his eyes from Krishma. Oh, I won't, bro. Promise, Krishma replied happily. She's a good girl. I like her. Yeah, Bakugo grunted with a smirk. She's changed me. He turned and walked off to the door. Oi, shitty hair, he called back over his shoulder. Good luck out there. Krishma's jaw fell open. Did Bakugo just wish me luck? Katsuki Bakugo? That's impossible. All he screams is profanities and die. He stared at the door as it swung closed. Maybe Yin is a better influence than we all thought possible, he thought. Bakugo made his way up to the stands and sat down beside you, slinging an arm across the back of your seat and wrapping his hand around your shoulder. You smiled at him as he gave your shoulder a squeeze and your lips a quick peck before settling back to watch the next round of contestants. Hey baby, he said lowly, still looking out onto the field. Want to go on that date we were planning a while back? Oh, that one where I was to wear something nice because it was special, you said, smirking at him slyly. He chuckled slightly. Yeah, that one. Well, yes, then I'd love to go on that one, you said cheekily. Cool. Saturday night then, he said casually, still not looking at you. You studied his side profile. He was such a good looking guy and you sighed happily. Can't wait, he whispered softly with a grin. Saturday night rolled around and you put on that dress that you knew back ago would like checking it over in the mirror the doorbell rang and you froze for a second checking your watch surely that's not him he's half an hour early katsuki's never that early you panicked just as you were about to walk out of your bedroom to see if it was him your phone dinged it's just me his message said i know i'm early you keep getting ready i'm just talking to your folks odd you thought back ago never wanted to talk to your parents you were highly suspicious but decided to let him be you shrugged and sent him a quick reply. Okay, almost ready, I'll be down soon. He saw your message but didn't reply. As you fixed your hair, you could hear his rich voice from the kitchen and you smiled to yourself. He was indeed a very good looking and very good sounding man. You applied the finishing touches to your outfit and looked yourself over one more time before walking out of your room and down to the hall. Your stomach had started to flutter as you got closer to the kitchen. Why am I so nervous, you thought. You rounded the corner and your eyes fell on Katsuki. He was wearing black strap back pants with the silver straps hanging to his waist and a black silver and red jumper on his with his name printed on the back. You stifled a giggle. Still his own number one fan, I see. He was leaning casually on the countertop and glanced over his shoulder when he heard you in the doorway. You heard him inhale sharply then he, when he saw you and you blushed as he turned himself to rest his back against the counter to check you out his elbows propping him up on the bench top. Well, he said lowly, his eyes trailing down your body and then back up to your face. Aren't I a lucky man? He added with a wink. You looked past him to your mum and dad, who were both grinning from ear to ear. Ah, uh, hi, you stammered nervously, adding a little giggle to the end just for good measure. You ready to go? Bakugo asked, his eyes still taking in bits of you. Mm-hmm, you said with a shy smile and a nod. Have a great night, sweetheart, your mum said, beaming from ear to ear. She walked over and gave you a hug. I approve of this boy, she whispered softly in your ear as she hugged you. He's lovely. You pulled back and looked at her curiously. Did he say something? You asked quizzically. She just returned your question with a smile. Just have a good night, she said with a pat to your cheek. Okay, Mr and Mrs Lynn, be going, Bakugo said authoritatively from the front door. Mr. and Mrs. Lynn, you thought, staring at him in shock. 
Since when did he ever use such manners? You shook your head in disbelief and walked to his side. Are you okay? You asked him with a confused laugh. Yeah, why? He asked, his response a little faster than just a casual reply. You're acting strange, you said playfully. No, I'm not, he retorted, avoiding eye contact. You left the house and headed down the steps to the front gate, turning to wave to your parents before walking out. You sure you're okay? You pried again. You called my parents by their proper respects and you're acting a little nervous. He fidgeted with something in his pocket. I'm fine, he said gruffly. You decided not to push your luck, so just shrugged and mumbled, okay, before changing the subject. Thankfully, the special restaurant was just around the corner from your place, so it wasn't a far walk at all. The wait staff met you both at the entrance of the building, and Bakugo gave them a nod before they ushered the two of you out the back of the restaurant, where a private outdoor setting had been arranged. You gasped when you walked into the dimly lit area. The trestle lattice roofing was lined with fairy lights, and a dining table was set up for the two of you, arranged in the middle of the little gazebo. You looked over at Bakugo as you walked. You were in awe. This is beautiful, you whispered to him. He was watching your every move with his crimson eyes, a soft look on his face. Wouldn't want anything less for my beautiful girl, he said lowly, a smirk gracing his gorgeous features. Did you ask for this? You asked incredulously. Of course, he snorted, not sitting inside with all that unnecessary noise. I just want it to be you and me, together, alone. His sexy voice caused your heart to flutter. To be alone with Bakugo was just amazing. You seated yourself and he sat opposite you. Some flowers were arranged in a vase in the middle of the table and it blocked his view of you, which he was most unimpressed with. So once the staff had given you both a rundown of the specials and recommendations and left, he grabbed the vase in his hand and pegged it over the back wall of the yard. You grimaced as you heard a faint smash in the distance and a cat yowl. Yeah, he said proudly, sitting back down in his chair. Much better. I can see you perfectly now, he said. His head lowered seductively and his red eyes trained on you. Both arms were on the table, leaning forward with interest. So, um, what do you want to eat? You asked, nervously looking down at the menu to avoid having a heart attack from the way he was looking at you. You, he said lowly. Your eyes shut up and met his, his voice causing a throbbing tension in your core. You bit your bottom lip to stifle any noise that threatened to slip from your lips. He smirked when he saw the look on your face. I'm only kidding. You're for dessert, he added casually. You cracked a smile. He could always make you feel better. You want entrees, baby? He asked, picking up the menu and looking it over. I'll take the Katsuki spring roll, you quipped quickly. He glanced up over at you with a smirk. Careful what you wish for, he growled sed seductively. The night was going well. Bakugo was very sexually charged, but you were used to that by now. You liked that this man was smitten by you and was vocal about it. At times, he'd go quiet and be deep in thought about something, then would snap out of it and be back to normal. The time came for dessert and he excused himself to talk to the chef about the special dessert that he had ordered for you. He came back looking a little more relieved and prodded you with questions to see if you could guess what he had ordered. You guessed at first go. It was your favourite type of custard cake. You were feeling full from dinner, but just the thought of your favourite cake magically made room for dessert and you waited eagerly for it to arrive. Finally, the waiter brought it out and sat it down in front of you. You gonna have some? You asked Bakugo, holding a spoon to him. No, you go first. Might try a bit later, he said, leaning forward intently. You eyed him as you took a mouthful. This is delicious, you said, mouth half full of cake. He waited expectantly. You swallowed and took another scoop, popping it in your mouth and chewing again. He looked like he was on edge, almost as if he was waiting for something to happen. You okay? You chuckled with your brows furrowed in confusion. Why are you looking at me like that? No reason, he snapped, his gaze unwavering. You are getting suspicious now. What have you done to the cake, Katsuki? You asked cautiously. Nothing, he yelled. Whoa, calm down, you said with another bewildered chuckle. What's gotten into you? You took another mouthful and bit into something hard. You frowned and put the spoon down, swirling the hard object around in your mouth and raising a hand to your lips to pull it out. Bakugo stood up and walked to beside your chair and knelt down on one knee. You looked at him, dumbfound. What's he doing? You fished out the hard object and looked at it. It was a ring. You gasped. K Katsuki? Baby, hear me out, he said lowly, looking up at you from where he knelt on the ground. You reached out and he reached out and took your hand. 
I know we're not old enough to get married, so this is a promise ring. I promise that one day I'll truly make you mine. But for now, I'll love you, hold you, cherish you with all I have. I'm not the type for mushy stuff, but I'll make an exception just this once for you, he said, averting his eyes with embarrassment. He was stunned into silence. He was being so sincere. Your eyes fell on the ring in your hand and you welled up, tears threatening to spill. Bakugo must have sensed the heightening of your emotions and looked up at you. Oi, he yelped, startled at seeing you close to tears. What's wrong? I'm, I'm so happy, you sniffed. He let out a sigh of relief and stood, kissing you on the forehead. Will you accept my promise? He asked softly, holding your forehead to his cheek. Yes, yes, of course, you squealed, tears streaming down your face. He kissed you on the forehead again and took the ring from your hand, ushering a waiter to come and take it away to be cleaned. It's okay, it's coming back, he chuckled lowly when he saw your worried gaze following the disappearing ring. The waiter brought it back within a minute and it sparkled as Bakugo placed it on your finger. It was the perfect fit. It's meant to be, you said, raising your hand up to admire it. Bakugo smiled softly at you and leaned in to kiss your lips. This time his kiss wasn't hungry or passionate, it was gentle and loving. The man that you had started off hating was now putty in your hands. He was still rough around the edges but oh so gooey in the middle and you loved him. You cuddled up together side by side for a little bit before he suggested to head home. You were excited to show your parents the ring now that they, you knew that they approved. Bakugo was a lot more relaxed after he gave you the ring and you quizzed him about it as you walked home together. Were you nervous? You asked him, nudging him. Yeah. I was nervous, he exclaimed. Wouldn't you be? Nah, you laughed, knowing that you were lying through your teeth. You'd be a nervous wreck. As if, he snorted with a smirk. I know you're tough and all, but you're not that good. So you're going to tell me what you and my parents were talking about? You asked, that ever-burning question still in the back of your mind. Oh, that, he said, quickly falling silent for a moment. I... Uh, told him about my intentions tonight giving you the ring and all you asked their permission you asked dumbfound no he snorted i'm back ago kasky i don't ask for anyone's opinion or blessing or anything he said proudly but i did let them know how serious i am about you your heart skipped a beat and you smiled to yourself so lucky he took his hand out of his pocket and reached for yours taking it unusually tenderly in his you walked hand in hand silently for a few minutes, comfortable in each other's presence. Thank you for tonight, he said looking up at him. I had the best time. He smirked at you and lifted his hand up to kiss the back of your hand. Same baby, same. Everyone was up when you got home and were all eagerly awaiting to see the ring that you were all too pleased to show off. Good work, dear, your grandma said to Bakugo, giving him a good nudge in the arm. He smirked at her and then looked across at you and winked. We need to go out to celebrate tomorrow night, your mum said. Let me organise it with Mitsuki and Masaru. Bakugo groaned loudly. I'm not going to hear the end of it. Old Hag's going to give it to me for weeks. Dinner the next night was way out hyped up by Mitsuki, who was overjoyed that her horrible son had managed to snag himself such a sweet girl. Everyone arrived at the restaurant at the same time and Bakugo gave you his best Hey there, sexy, smirk as you walked up to him. He gave you a heated kiss before taking your hand and prouded, proudly walking you inside the restaurant. The proud smirk on his face faded quickly though when his eyes fell on a long table at the back of the restaurant filled with some particularly familiar looking people. You glanced along the row and recognised a few of the patrons. Is that all mine? You whispered softly to Bakugo, who grunted a confirmation in response. Are they all heroes? You whispered again when a few other people seated there looked familiar. He grunted again. And some UA staff, he mumbled with disappointment. Why the hell are they here? You giggled. Katsuki, they can go to dinner wherever they want to. They're allowed to dine here. Yeah, but this is my night, not theirs, he grunted. You laughed. Stop it, you silly boy, he chided playfully. We're sitting over here anyway. You pointed to a table set out for your family and his. Waiters were standing patiently, waiting to help you take your seats. You sat down and both families followed, and you smiled at all of them as your eyes fell on your grandma, who was staring at the hero table. Grandma? you called. She was too enthralled in her own thoughts and didn't hear you. Grandma! you called again. She jumped and looked at you. Yes, she said, looking a little flustered. You okay? you asked, glancing across at the other table. 
You're checking out the muscle over there, are you? You asked her with a cheeky smile. Oh, yes, dear, she responded with a fake smile and looked back over there again. You followed her gaze and scanned the people, but nothing stood out to you, so you decided to leave it be. Mitski made a speech, much to Bakugo's dismay, and then everyone tucked into the delicious food that was served. The whole night that you were there, you were either making eyes at Katsuki beside you or watching your grandma, who was sitting across from you. She didn't eat much. She was watching the hero table too intently. At one point, All Might came over and said hello to Bakugo and shook hands with everyone on the table. He seemed like a lovely man and had a lot of good things to say about Katsuki, all said with a giant smile, of course. He was in his power form and a sight to behold. You were awestruck at his size. You never expected him to be so tall. Your grandma was polite to him, but she still had her eyes on the hero table. Um, excuse me, Sir All Might, she called out suddenly as he was about to leave. May I inquire as to the name of the senior hero over there in the yellow suit? All Might looked back over to the table and identified who she was referring to. Oh, my esteemed teacher, Gran Torino, he said with a smile. Would you like me to make introductions? He asked politely. Gran Torino. No, that's fine. Thank you kindly. I must be mistaken, she said, her facial expressions falling. Okay, All Might replied, still a little curious. He excused himself and wished everyone a good night before heading back to his own table. You saw him sit down and say something to the man named Gran Torino, and the elderly man looked up at your grandma. You glanced at her. She blushed and looked away when she saw Gran Torino was looking at her. You nudged Katsuki, who was also watching the exchange. You gave him a little eyebrow wiggle and turned back to watch what would happen between your grandma and this elder hero. To your delight, he had stood up and was making his way around the table towards your grandma. You looked at her and hissed, He's coming over! She nearly had a heart attack and looked like she was about to get up and flee the scene. Miss, Gran Torino said, nearing your grandma. May I know your given name? She turned and looked up at him, a tear in her eye. Hello, Sorohiko. It's been a while. His eyes widened and he whispered your grandma's first name. She nodded again and smiled, and he just stood there and stared at her. You and Bakugo had no idea what was going on, but you could feel something special was going to happen. It was obvious that these two had history, but what type of history? Bakugo was the first to clear his throat. Oi, he called to Gran Torino. How do you know grandma? Grandma interjected before he could answer and gave a vague reply about them being acquainted in the past before turning back to Gran Torino. Miss, may I have your contact details? He asked a little bashfully. Then he paused before asking a different question. Oh, excuse me, is there a mister? His voice trailed off. Grandma shook her head sadly. No, dear, he passed away eight years ago. Oh, my apologies, Gran Torino replied, although you noted he didn't look too upset. Your grandma gave him your home phone number and he walked back to the table. The rest of the night was spent watching Grandma make eyes at Gran Torino from across the room and you giggled at how cute it was. Gran Torino was also watching her intently too and you were dying to ask your grandma more about it when you got home. Katsuki livened up as the night went on and you enjoyed his company immensely. He never failed to make you smile with his stories and actions. Later that night you crept to your grandma's door and knocked softly. Yes, she called from inside her room. Grandma, you asked, pushing the door open. How do you know Gran Torino? She beamed from ear to ear. Well, dear, he's my soulmate. The boy I used to swap bodies with all those years ago. Your jaw hit the floor. Seriously, you screeched. Him? Yes, dear, she chuckled. Is that a problem? No, no, you hurriedly replied. Not at all, it's just... He's famous. Well, he used to be famous, you said. Bakugo had filled you in on Gran Torino's background. He used to be a working hero, but he never got much coverage by the media, hence why Grandma hadn't seen him up until now. So are you two going to see each other? You pried with a suggestive eyebrow wiggle. Your grandma chuckled. Well, I would like to, but it look, takes two to tango, she added with her usual flair. I think he likes you too, Grandma. Don't worry. He wouldn't have asked about Grandpa if he wasn't interested in dating you, he said with a gentle smile. Heavens, dating? Grandma said, placing her hand on her cheek in mock shock. It's been so long since I dated. 
You'll be fine, Grandma, you laugh. It's just like riding a bike. Once you get the hang of it, you never forget. Your grandma ended the saying for you. True, but if I do forget, I know who to come to. She winked at you. You smiled. Yep, I'll be here as your guru of dating, you said playfully, fists on hips adopting a hero pose. Grandma laughed. Good to know. Thank you, guru. You're welcome, you said with a smile. Well, I'm off to bed now. Sweet dreams of Gran Torino, Grandma, you giggled. Oh, stop it, she laughed. Good night, Yin. Bakugo came over to see you after school the next day, and the two of you went up to your room. Bakugo had the usual agenda on his mind and initiated a heavy makeout session, which you gladly succumbed to, relishing in his kisses. Oh, hey, I have something to tell you, you said to him, pushing him off your face a bit so that you could catch your breath and talk. In a second, he replied, trying to recommence Operation Eat Face. No now, you giggled, fighting to hold him at bay. He entertained your wriggles and tried to pin you down playfully while you struggled to get free. You managed to roll over onto your stomach and tried to press up off the bed. Oh, you like it from behind, do you? He mumbled into your ear as he smirked. And what if I do? You replied provocatively to tease him up a little bit more. Oh, that's hot, he growled grinding his hips into your backside. You could feel that he was well and truly excited from the conversation and you giggled. You're so easy to get hot and bothered, Katsuki, you said, turning your head to look at him. Only when it comes to you, he replied, kissing you down your cheek and neck. What do you have to tell me? He asked, pushing off you. I'm thinking of heading back to school to complete my final year, you said proudly. Since the accident and seizures, you hadn't attended school and it had been a year now since you'd stopped your education. Seriously? Awesome, he said, grinning at you. Which school? Um, well, there's a school just around the corner from UA that I've applied for. I submitted a hardship form, so hopefully that plays in my favour. He smiled weakly. I cycle through thinking I'm doing the right thing to maybe this isn't such a good idea. Bakugo leaned down and kissed you again. It's the right thing. You'll be fine. I'm here for you too. You smiled up at him. Who would have ever thought the great Bakugo Katsuki would ever be this soft? You winked. I'm not soft, what the hell? He scrunched his nose up in abhorrence, completely and utterly offended at being called such a despicable word. You laughed heartily and sat up. Come on, softie, let's go get some snacks. Don't call me that, he seethed as you got up off the bed and walked to the bedroom door. Sorry, cat softie, you leered back at him. That's it, he growled jumping up and making small explosives in the palms of his hands. You screamed and flung the door open, but caught yourself before you barreled into Grandma. She was all dressed up, and you stopped and looked at her. Oh, you look nice. Are you going out? You questioned her. She stuck her hip out and acted like a teenager. Yes, Mum. I'm going out. What does it look like? She finished with an eye roll just for good measure. You fell apart laughing. Grandma, you're too funny, he said, wiping a tear of laughter from your eye. You got a date, Grandma? Bakugo asked from behind you. Yes, I do, actually, she said, eyes sparkling. You gasped. Is it Gran Torino? <gasps> it is, isn't it? You squealed with excitement and clapped your hands. Shh! Grandma shushed you harshly. He's in the living room. He'll hear you. You clamped your hands over your mouth and giggled. Your grandma was being so cute right now. Have fun on your date, Grandma, you whispered between your fingers, still hands over your mouth. Thank you, dear, she whispered back. Don't kiss on the first date, Bakugo added. You don't play by your own rules, do you? You asked him quizzically, craning your head back over your shoulder. He smirked and shrugged. Can't help it if my date's smoking hot. You blushed and looked away, clearing your throat. You two are adorable, your grandma chimed in after watching you two interact. You smiled shyly and took her hand to walk her down to her date, and Bakugo followed behind. Gran Torino wasn't in his hero costume this time, and he looked just like a regular old man, but he was so cute the way he acted with your grandma, you would have thought that they were teenagers again. You and Bakugo, plus the rest of your family, saw them off at the gate and wished them a lovely date. Then your family left you two at the gate and went back inside. Wonder why those two hit it off so quick, Bakugo inquired aloud. He wasn't asking anyone in particular, but you decided to reply him anyway. Oh, didn't you know? He's her soulmate, you said proudly. What? he asked, 
Uh, it's a long story, he said dismissively. It involves body swapping and weird stuff like that. Bakugo looked at you dumbfound. No way. As in, yep. And they, yep. Crazy. Yeah. You stood smiling at him for a few more seconds before leaning up to kiss him. Katsuki, I don't know why it was you or why it was me, but I'm so glad it was us. Me too, baby. Me too. The end. And that is the end of Why You, Why Me. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next book.